a blue slide fades in. Blind superhero, daredevil in red appears, then swishes away. <laughs> Daredevil floats back in from the right, pulling a red banner with the logo for CC VIP. The slide ripples, fades, then two linear designs, one in gray, the other in blue, appear. The Computer Center for Visually Impaired People at Baruch College presents. The slide dissolves. The CCVIP and Baruch College CUNY logo flies down from the top. The 11th Annual Conference on Visual Impairment and Employment Policy and Practice. A red slide with a gray and blue linear design on the left appears. A photo swivels and reveals 10 advocates in CCVIP t-shirts at the Disability Pride Parade. The words, take action, are in the bottom. Sponsored by An illustration of New York State comes up with the words, New York State Commission for the Blind. The letters R, R, and A, and a rocket appear. The logo for Rosicky, Rosicky, and Associates. Reader's Digest, Partners for Sight Foundation, and their logo. The Jolson Family Foundation. A black slide emerges, and these words appear in white. National Australia Bank and their logo. Hidden City Cafe. We acknowledge the following for providing volunteers for our 11th annual conference. Standard Chartered, their logo. The slide splits to show another one in blue and the words New York Life in white. And our devoted students at Baruch College. Three pictures appear with Baruch students in CCVIP t-shirts assisting conference attendees. Join the conversation. Hashtag CCVIP Conference 2018. Follow us on Twitter at CCVIP. Facebook and YouTube CCVIP at Baruch. Rising from the bottom is a slide in blue with an illustration of hands offering Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi access, network, Baruch hyphen events, open a browser, password, CCVIP.
Stella, let me know. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 11th Conference on Visual Impairment at Policy and Practice with Baruch College Computer Center for Visually Impaired People and many others. Welcome. And welcome to all our streamers. This is a fabulous thing. We've never been able to do it before. So we're excited that you all are with us wherever you may be in the world. Isn't that stunning? It's really, really, really great. I, um, I have, we have lots of people to thank. And I want to mention a couple of special guests who are here um, that I'd like you to just acknowledge. One is Ms. Rachel Pardo, I believe, is here from New York Community Trust, who's been an important funder of CCVIP over many, many years. So Rachel, thank you so much for being here. And we also have with us uh, Susan Olivo, who is with Reader's Digest Partners for Sight, which gave us a very, very critical grant for this event today. So Susan, we're thrilled you're here. Thank you. And I'll just say that Susan expects everybody to take action as a result of this event. Okay, so you don't get off scot-free today. So I do have tons of people to thank, and I think it's important to do it. Um, our supporters were always grateful for the uh, Mark School of Public and um, International Affairs, and our, their dean, David Bertzel, is with us. You'll hear from him in a couple minutes. Um, but they're a great supporter and have been since day one. Also, the Commission for the Blind is here, which has also been a sponsor from very early on, and we'll hear from Paula uh, uh, a bit later. We have Riziki Riziki and Associates with Craig Wolfson is here. Uh, let's see, we have the Jolson Family Foundation. Thank you to Barbara Fife all these folks who help us. And we have a new sponsor this year, Australian National Bank Limited. Anita Steele is here, so a special welcome to Anita. And as always, we thank the Hidden City Cafe, Veronica and friends. They provided your Java and our other assorted goodies. And we do also thank Michael Cush and the customer service people of Blind Line. So let's give this bunch a big hand. And let me mention the conference planning committee. We have Gus Chalkius, Brett Eisenberg, Roberta Felice, Debbie Fitterer, Barbara, uh, Barbara Fife again, yes, because she does that with us, and Judith Gerber, Peter Herrick, Nancy O'Connell, Bill Reed, Lisa Saunders, and Vern Vergara. That's our conference planning committee. And for support, we have uh, Madeline Gilbo, who's in our office picking up strays and making sure that they get over here, which is very important. We have our instructors, Rick Fox, Lynette Tatum, and Tudor Maria Rios, who've been helping with uh, proofing Braille programs so they don't send you to the wrong place. Yep. Thank you. And we have our Valiant Advisory Board, which I'm thrilled. Iris Rosen, who flew back from meeting her new grandchild from Oregon last night to be here. So thank you to Iris. And then we have, on this board, we have Matt Krieger, Philip So, Sandy Kuprat, Craig Wolfson, and Jane Thompson. So we're very, very grateful to all these folks. We're also really grateful to the Conference Center staff, yes, for them. And then, as I said, um, we're really grateful as well to the, uh, our tech team, which we have one tech team assisting on the screening, I mean, sorry, the streaming, and we have another one assisting on our uh, London connection. So this is all very exciting. So we thank everybody, Stella and Dana and uh, Oliver and Greg Hernandez, and let's just, and Mohammed Rihan, let's give, and Joe Albanese and Victor Peralta, one big real shout out for all these guys. <laughs> and
And I'll ask Mr. Reed, our conference coordinator, did I leave anybody out? I did? Thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone. And now I want to give you a chance to hear from a couple of folks who were kind enough to uh, join me up here to greet you. I would first like to introduce you to my boss. Um, so her name is Ann Clarkson. She is the Associate Dean for the uh, School of Continuing and Professional Studies, which is our home here at Baruch College and has been for a whole number of years, since about 1996. So, um, Please give Anne a warm welcome, and let's just hear a couple remarks from her. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. More importantly, it's great to see all the uh, familiar faces and a few new ones. And uh, these are your morning remarks from the evil boss. <laughs> and uh, I use that term very lightly, but because in truth, we all report to Karen at the end of the day. <laughs> I'm up here. Um, first, I want to forego with the, uh, I mean, get the uh, logistics out of the way. And uh, thank you all for coming to the conference once again and to remind you how important it is for you to visit the vendors and uh, all of the sessions, which are, once again, exceptional this year. It's really an inspiration each time I see the creativity brought to this event and to the industry in general. But I'm up here today for a slightly different reason and uh, to make an announcement that Karen is quite unaware of. So this will be a surprise for her, too. Her team this year has made a special surprise for her, and I think it's illustrative of their dedication to her, but more importantly, her, the, their recognition to the contributions that she makes every year in every way and every day which, when she's here at Baruch and, into, and to this industry. So in an effort to recognize that, they made the executive decision to rename this conference. So this year, the conference will now be the Karen L. Gorgie Conference. They're not, the f they're not the first ones to recognize, nor are they the last ones to recognize her exceptional, exceptional work in this area and the contribution she's made to this college, to the people in this room, and more importantly, to the students that have come through the door of this institution and many others throughout her career. And really, she's an inspiration. And she may call me her boss, but she's truly the person I answer to on the phone. When I see her call, I know she wants something. And if I don't give it to her, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> and you know, she really, she really has been an inspiration to me since I came to this college, because the entrepreneurialism and the spirit in which she attacks her job and the services that she gives to her students is what really I, I have always aspired to and I try to get my team to aspire to on a daily basis. In this environment, in any environment, but especially in Baruch's environment, you just simply can't take no for an answer. You know there's a prize at the end of the day, and that prize is getting a student the education and the services they need so that they can succeed not only in the classroom, but more importantly, outside the classroom and support themselves and their family. And that's really what this is all about. That's what this industry is all about. And Karen has done that for her entire career and has made such a fundamental change in so many lives. And that's really why this conference has been re renamed the Karen L. Gorgie Conference. So I just want to say... I think we all des she all deserves a standing ovation for this one. I right, give it back to Karen. Wait. Wait. Oh, you need this mic. Yikes, I can't talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And now <laughs> we are being joined today by Paula, um, and I don't have my piece of paper, so I'm going to say it wrong. Say your last name again. Just Paula. <laughs> Paula Napa Fakara, and I forgive me. That is terrible, but Anne got me shook up, and so I left my you know cheat sheet on the table. It's Anne's fault. 
Um, anyway, Paula, Paula is fabulous. She's been coming here for a couple of years. She's the district manager of the uh, Long Island office of the Commission for the Blind. And Paula is here to uh, give us a few remarks on behalf of the commission and herself, I hope. Anyway, thank you, Paula. Good morning. I know I'm the person with a lot of names and a lot of vowels, so I think I'm just going to go by Paula from now on. Cher does it, so I'm going to do it. Um, good morning. On behalf of the New York State Commission for the Blind and Associate Commissioner Brian Daniels, congratulations on the 11th annual CCVIP Employment and Visual for Employment of People with Visual Impairment. CCVIP is a very important partner of ours, and we want to thank, take this opportunity for Karen to acknowledge all your leadership skills in the field and take this opportunity to really acknowledge all your advocacy and what you've done for technology and people with visual impairments in the field. Um, because of that, CCVIP is one of the cutting edge um, vendors that we use for services. You can imagine for Associate Commissioner Brian Daniels and Jason Eckert and Peter Eckert not to be here, there has to be a good reason. They're being holed up and sequestered in an office in Albany for the uh, six-year review for, from the Rehab Services Administration. I'm sure we'll come out winning and stellar and still be in existence, but it's one of those regular things you have to do to keep the money flowing, so otherwise they would be here. But today's theme, take action. The, even though I'm a district manager, I'm a rehab counselor by training, and the rehab counselor in me is saying, yes, let's, take, let's make this happen. Let's take this opportunity for us to work together to gather our information, as much information as possible from technology, from inspiring successful employment practices, and from networking to set a plan in place that allows you to move forward and achieve your success and your goals. Um, we can level the playing field by getting together using technology, creating a plan that works for us, and allowing you to become successful in your employment goals. Um, and I can think of no other place for then it to happen here at the Commission for, um, at, excuse me, at the Commission for the Blind and for the CCVIP, of course. It's a team, actually it is a team approach. I was told not to mention something, and Karen swore me to secrecy, but I am a Red Sox fan, so she told me <laughs> that. <laughs> So, but I didn't watch my game, in respect for New York, I did not watch the game. Karen thought I was not a native of New York. I said, no, 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 I am, I'm just an anomaly, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I, I can assure you this is going to be a wonderful conference, and I wonder, and I get, uh, I'm looking forward for today's event. So please enjoy, and let's gather information and take action. Thank you. Thank you. Finally this morning, I'm very grateful and happy to uh, introduce to you a gentleman who I bet has been at almost every one of these conferences. Um, it's Dean David Burtzell from the Mark School, who has been a friend of the center at least since the 90s. He spent years on the advisory board, and he's smart enough he's not on it. No, sorry. <laughs> but truly, truly a helper, a supporter, a partner, and um, a, a, a just a really energizing and inspiring person to, to be around and to have as, as a colleague and a friend. Please welcome David Burtzell. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everyone here, to feel the energy in this room. To all of our friends who are joining us via the live stream, we're so delighted that you could be here since you can't be in the room specifically. But I think when you hear the panelists and when you get a sense of exactly what people are up to, maybe next year you'll be able to put yourself up here on the 14th floor of the vertical campus at Baruch College. Um, thank you, Karen, for those kind words. It has, in fact, I was just reflecting on this yesterday evening in preparing my remarks today, I've been a quarter century since I first became involved uh, with CCVIP. And I can tell you that it has been a relationship born of extraordinary uh, commitment, 
the commitment that I see on Karen's part, on everybody who's employed by CCVIP, and the kind of work that CCVIP does across the length and breadth of its programs. Now, as Karen mentioned, I'm Dean of the Mark School of Public and International Affairs, and public policy is our lifeblood, thinking about research in public policy and about teaching people how to manage organizations and ultimately to implement policies. And I'd like to remind you as we read the full title of the conference program here, uh, policy features prominently. Employment is important for all of the reasons that Ann talked about, for all of the reasons that Paula talked about, and we should take that seriously, even though she is a Red Sox fan. Uh, that, you know, in terms of independence, in terms of the health of communities, in terms of returns to the tax base and all of the things that we all want to do. But policy goes beyond employment. And I think we should be aware that that's something that CCVIP has always taken seriously. Uh, whether it's the creation of new technologies to facilitate people's uh, ability to participate fully in education and the workforce, such as the Talking tact uh, Tactile Tablet series, such as the audio uh, guides that once populated Penn Station, and may once again, once we get to Moynihan Station, uh, but uh, ways for people literally and figuratively to navigate their communities and their lives. When we think about what Karen has done here, and there is always an elected official, or often many elected officials here at this conference, she understands that people succeed to a certain extent by asking for the assistance that they require from the officials who are elected and paid for the purpose of providing that assistance. It's a message of empowerment, and it's something that's led to the creation of audio street uh, indicators, uh, often right, some in this very neighborhood a little bit to our west, uh, but ways that Karen has helped rebuild the physical infrastructure by making the needs of this community plain in City Hall and in Albany. And when we think about the broader context of an aging population, what we know to be a certain increase in the level of visual impairment among the population, including the employed population, that it's important to get out in front of the policy process and help our elected and appointed officials understand what's going on. Karen's work, CCVIP's work, has clearly been about all of these issues in the context of visual impairment and service to the community, uh, participating in visual impairment, uh, whether as visually impaired people themselves, partners, spouses, sisters, brothers, employers, etc. Um, but I want to underscore that Karen's message and CCVIP's message applies to each and every one of us. What do we need? Who influences our ability to obtain what we need? What do we need to know and whom do we need to know to ask effectively, consistently, and powerfully for what we need? And in doing that, we are not just advancing our own interests, we're advancing community, we're advancing the ability of this city, this state, this nation, and everyone across the world to do well in their lives, their professions, and everything that they entangle with themselves, themselves with in the course of their lives. These are important commitments in any civil society. And there is no better illustration of that work than the work that Karen Gorgi and CCVIP does. So I'd like to conclude with a note of gratitude, which is where, uh, where Karen started off today. But I'm going to thank Karen. I'm going to uh, thank everybody involved with CCVIP, all of the supporters, all of my former colleagues on the board, uh, most notably Karen herself for working so assiduously over such a long period of time on this absolutely critical set of competencies and orientations that benefits every last living soul in this city and beyond. Thanks very much. I have one more group to thank. Uh, very quickly, because we're about to go to London, but I want to thank a group of people in this audience. You all know we had extra costs for this conference this year, and we were afraid, would we have to charge? How would this be? So we asked for your help. And there are probably 30 people in this room who 
actually helped us and made extra donations so that this conference could really happen. So I'm not going to mention 30 names. I'd really get yelled at. But, but I think we should all give those folks who donated to this event a huge hand. And now, the exciting, well, I think that was all pretty exciting, actually. Um, but now we are ready to um, welcome to our midst uh, Jenny Lay Fleury. Are we still good with London, Joe? Sounds like we're good. So I just want to read you a little bit of her bio, and, and then I, she will be ready to deliver her keynote to us, which is just thrilling. So Jenny Leigh Fleury has a passion to see people reach their full potential, including people with disabilities. Jenny is the Chief Accessibility Officer at Microsoft, leading their effort to drive their product development and services and websites to empower people and organizations to achieve more. Her team is at the forefront of creating positive experiences that apply technology to make a difference in the world and in the lives of individuals from how, um, from how they support people with disabilities in employment to innovative technology that aims to revolutionize what's possible for people with disabilities. With help from her team and with the broader community at Microsoft, Jenny's many, many initiatives to empower people with disabilities both in and out of Microsoft are just astounding. Uh, they include things like creating the Disability Answer Desk, which some of us might know, which provides specialist customer support to people with disabilities, to hosting the annual Microsoft Ability Summit, which focuses on empowering attendees. Um, 800 people apparently attended this last one. Um, and inclusive, innovative thinking necessary to enable people around the world. Also instrumental in projects such as Soundscape, which we might hear a little bit about, and the Microsoft Ability Hackathon, which has supported over 270 hackathon teams focused on empowering people with disabilities with new technologies and capabilities. Now, outside of Microsoft, Jenny is the current board chair of a really important group known as the Business Leadership Network that has all to do with uh, hiring of people with disabilities. And she was recognized by the White House as a champion for change in October 2015. And I really want to thank her so much. I want to thank her interpreter for being with us and Steve Bradbury, who is uh, uh, doing the technical end of things, as well as all of our technical people here. Ladies and gentlemen, join me, please, in welcoming Jenny Lay Fleury. Hello there. Can you hear me in New York? Fantastic. Well, it's great to be here, and thank you so much for such a kind, uh, just a, a kind introduction. I, I'm really not that cool, so um, it's always great that somebody else mentions that. You'll discover that it's all an illusion very quickly um, as I walk through. Um, but thank you for having me in New York. I apologize for not being there in person, uh, but I'm incredibly glad that technology is such a cool thing, uh, that I can appear five hours ahead of you here in our London office in, in Paddington, not the Bear, there is a place. Um, uh, actually, I'm in the Downing Street meeting room in our Microsoft offices here. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just walk you through a little bit about what we've been up to and give you some under the covers of, you know, kind of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And hopefully, all being well, um, have some time for questions. Uh, so please store them. Uh, I'm sure you have them. I know that New Yorkers are not shy. Um, I'm aware of it. Uh, so let me, let me walk you through a little bit about what we're up to and kind of what our ethos is in, in what we're doing here um, that give you some sense um, of why accessibility has become such a strategic imperative at Microsoft. So the first thing to, that I wallow in a little bit, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir some, it's just the definition of disability. 
And I really do think that it's very important that that definition changed in 2011. Uh, it used to be defined as something that was broken with an individual. It's changed to be something that is a mismatch between an individual and the environment in which they're in. I think that's really important for many reasons. Um, not just because it helps me as a person with a disability to think about things in a different way, but as a Microsoft, which is 110,000 nerds all around the world, uh, accessibility and disability becomes a design principle. And by the way, nerds is a very complimentary term in my world. Um, it's, a, it's a big compliment to be called a nerd. And as we look at the world of disability, you know this. I mean, it's huge, a billion plus. Um, and I also wallow in the fact that disability comes at any point in life. It is attributed to age. If you're not in the cool gang now, you likely will be. Um, and also it's something that you can come in and out of at any point in your life, that most of disability is acquired later in life. And by the way, the picture behind me is of a gentleman on my team called Nikkei's dog bow. Um, and I was asked recently uh, if I had hired an actor to represent disability, if I'd hired actors, I'm like, no, this guy is just too cool not to have on the page. Um, he is a, a fantastic figure of a man who wears fedoras like no one else I know, um, and uh, African-American African with his cane. Uh, I don't think it gets much better than that. So all the pictures we have are of real folk on our team. So if you look at the history with Microsoft and what we've been doing over this time, there's a couple of things to, to recognize. Um, I love history. I went back into the history books of Microsoft. We've been around 42 years, uh, which I happen to know because it's my age, which I'll then very quickly move on. Uh, no woman should ever disclose their age. Um, but I've just done it. And it, actually, accessibility really began in 97 um, with a gentleman called Bill Gates who you may know, um, who announced accessibility as an area of priority for the company 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago. And at the same time, our first employee groups were coming in. And our employee groups, the first ones were ADD, our huddle group, which is our deaf community, our parents of children with autism, which remains our largest community at Microsoft still today, and VIP, which is visually impaired persons, I know is not the most correct politically, uh, politically correct term, but it's a community that loves being called VIPs. Who would? Um, now that, that community has grown. And when I joined the company back in 2005, actually here in London, before I relocated over to Seattle a couple of years later, uh, there were six groups. There's now 15. Um, and the 15 groups represent the full spectrum of disability, with a few exceptions that we're still to add in. The latest groups are in areas that I think are in the invisible category, which, as we know, is about 90%, 70% of disability is invisible. So our new groups are areas like post-traumatic stress, eating disorders, traumatic brain injury, and more. Um, and I look forward to seeing that group evolve into areas of mental health. And my, my entry here was really through my own deafness. I am severely, profoundly deaf. Uh, I joined the company at Microsoft thinking that it would be a great person for a deaf, a great company for a deaf person. And then quickly found that actually, contrary to my belief, Microsoft actually like, they like to talk to one another in meetings, over one another, with lots of accents and loud voices and, uh, quickly found that I struggled with that. You know, I had this illusion that they would all like to talk to one another by email. Not the case. And so once I joined the deaf community, I got nosy. I joined all the others. And I found that they were all saying some of the same stuff, which was, how can I talk to my manager about this? How do I self-identify? Aren't we a technical company? And shouldn't we be doing something crazy in this space? Uh, so I was chair of that group. We formed that group, um, which has grown. And that Ability Summit referenced earlier uh, was 80 people eight years ago. And I was cheering down the corridors like a mad lunatic. Um, and now that same conference has, on average, had between 800 and 1,000 attendees internally at Microsoft every year. 
Um, and next month, I'm actually heading back over the pond, um, back to Seattle to get ready for the next annual conference, which is in May. Um, and for the first time, we are opening the doors to the public. Uh, so we're very excited and horribly terrified um, to see what happens. So a couple of years ago, um, things started to take a really big shift at Microsoft, and we decided to really lean into all of the employee goodness and that opportunity with technology. I think over 20 years, um, many of you who probably used our technology would probably support me in saying this. We've had moments of brilliance and moments of not. Um, and we wanted a couple of years ago to really take an opportunity to reboot it at Microsoft. That's when I moved into the role of Chief Accessibility Officer, which really is a fancy title that means that my job is to embed disability and accessibility into the DNA of Microsoft. And my job really is to make sure that it's as part of our culture, that it's part of how we work, it's part of how we communicate, it's part of our products, and find that way to really motivate the company to do some crazy things. And there are four pillars to how we set out to do it. And I'm really thrilled that you know, a couple of years on now, I can tell you that some of this has started to really drive a big impact for us albeit with a long way to go. I don't think accessibility ever has an end destination. And so the first of those four is our culture. And I think culture is something that we all know about, but it's actually very simple at the core. It's about making sure, if you're going to build accessibility into the heart of what you do, that you have people with disabilities at the heart of what you do. So we've been very, very focused at bringing in you can clap it's good i can't hear you but i, I can see it um, but it's bringing people with disabilities in i'm keeping going we're on a time clock here people um i it, and there's really three ways that we've done this and there's a lot more information than what i'm going to tell you okay and um and there's a few websites that are embedded into some of this literature that we will make sure you get um but three ways i'll quickly call out uh, one is focusing on developmental disability um, we've actually been focused on this for quite some time um, and that's how you bring people into jobs like in our gardens and our kitchens We've had over 200 hires in the Seattle area with 1% attrition. It's how you also focus on broad disability. And I'll tell you that Gold Dust is a blind developer. That is Gold Dust. I cannot get enough. Uh, and I, it's really simple. You just think about it. If you are a blind developer, you are developing accessible code by design. Right? We're not having to fix anything or remedy anything or educate. Uh, we're just, it's built into the product. And the other one is autism, where we've been deeply focused on how we can bring people with autism in, um, which is an area that is untapped. The unemployment, underemployment is over 80%. But a lot of these guys and girls have insane education in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And inclusive design is the other one that I'll call out on culture, because inclusive design means that you're building accessibility into your product just by designing. It means that you do it at the beginning. You should never do it at the end. Um, and so every person at Microsoft gets trained on this. Um, whether you're building a fancy office like the beautiful one here in Paddington or in Seattle, or you're working on the next version of Windows. And I think the other second pillar as I move through is talking about transparency. And this is a very customer-focused mindset. So one of the things as I migrated from uh, my, my job before I lived and breathed accessibility 24-7, I used to be a technical support leader. That was what I did. I actually joined the company to work on Hotmail. If anyone remember, are they old enough to remember the room Hotmail with the back of the yes. uh, But how do you make sure that you have all the information on every product at your fingertips. So as you're walking, in, walking into a workplace and you see that they're using Excel, you can go and check that Excel to make sure that that version, what, what works great, what have I got to work around? Does it work with JAWS? Does it work with Narrator? 
What, what, give me that info. So every single product, every conformance statement is new and it's loaded onto our site and we've redone the site. Some of you remember the old one, which was really good. My thumbs down. We've redone it. It's microsoft.com slash accessibility. Um, and that's all the information on our products. And also we've Try to chunk it into documents that will help you. So you'll see two sways here, uh, which are presentation documents. And they have every single feature in every single one of our products, from Windows to Xbox, broken down by disability type. And these are simple things that you can go online and, and check out. We keep them up to date with everything coming out. And there is a lot coming out. And the same with all of our inclusive hiring practices. Because if we're going to change the unemployment rate, which is double that for people with disabilities, we have to hire around 500,000 people with disabilities into the US workforce. Microsoft only has 110. We have to work together to drive the employment of people with disabilities. So we give every piece of knowledge that we've learned, we put it out and we document and we share it. A couple of other things I'll linger on, um, and I'll show you a couple of videos. One is Disability Answer Desk. Who's heard of it, Disability Answer Desk? Anyone? A couple of you. Well, if you don't, um, and in fact, actually, we, we call this DAT. That's our acronym. I have no mom. I have a dad team. Um, an actual fact, I will tell you that my dad is actually in the room with me here in London. I bring dad's work day here in, uh, in London. Um, but dad is a, is a simple 1-800 number away. It's free support for customers with disabilities using accessible tech. We've just added a channel within Be My Eyes, which is a great free app. If you haven't tried it, please do. We take about 300,000 calls a year. Um, and those calls are gold dust. We get to hopefully help you get with your use of technology, get up and running if you've got a problem, or figure out what is the right AT for you, give you some advice on what's available. And then we also get feedback from you. We get to hear what's working, what's not. If there's things we've got to fix, and all of that feedback goes right back to the engineer to get stuff fixed. So it's gold dust. In fact, let me give you this quick little video that shows you. I think that the Disability Answer Desk is a really great thing. David Bouchard, a Be My Eyes user, describes his experience. I use the Be My Eyes app uh, pretty frequently. I use it to get visual information that otherwise wouldn't be available to me, such as a uh, maybe a sign, a LED screen. Senior Technical Advisor Chitra speaks from the Microsoft Disability Answer Desk Center. At Microsoft Disability Answer Desk, we provide free technical support for customers with disabilities. With this integration with Be My Eyes, we can help you with tasks like installing Office 365, troubleshooting your internet connection, or even learning about the physical characteristics of your new Surface Book. The service offers free technical support for people with disabilities. All the users have to do is go ahead and click on the specialized help, and there is an option for them to contact the Microsoft Disability Answer Desk to help them with any technical issues they have. Free app for iOS and Android. Thank you for calling the Microsoft Disability Answer Desk. How can I assist you today? It really takes away the visual barrier that sometimes exists. Because it's a free service, I'm really pleased that it augments the skills that I have. We want to make sure we give our best service to our customers when and how they want. Everyone who's blind and has a smartphone should have it on their phone. I really applaud Microsoft for taking this step. Learn more at aka.ms forward slash be my eyes. Microsoft. Kind of fun, right? Um, and yes, we do audio describe our videos. I actually have an in house team that audio describes all of our videos. And so let me give you a couple of really quick things that have come out of focus on this culture. And I'm going to give you some really quick examples. The first one I'm going to talk about is learning tools. This isn't for blindness, this is for dyslexia. And it came out of a hackathon. Who's hacked? Anyone know what a hack is in the room? 
Oh, people. Some of you, maybe. A hackathon is really where you get a bunch of people, a crazy idea, and no light, a lot of coffee, a lot of pizza, and you spend some time really figuring out how to solve a problem. This was how could you solve reading rates? How could you help empower kids with dyslexia to increase their reading rates? And we, they created learning tools. It's now in, our, in Microsoft Word. It's in Office Lens. It's in Edge, our browser, which is accessible. Um, and it, it really is showing to help kids increase their reading rates. And we've proven that it gives them a 10% jump. And it just separates words, separates syllables, gives different colors. It gives extra spacing. Stuff that we found out scientifically can help these kids and adults. Uh, to read documents more quickly. Another quick one, Accessibility Checker. Um, this actually has been around for a long time, but it was hidden in some mystery menu, deep, dark, in the, in the sort of basement of Microsoft Office, and no one could find it. So we moved it next to Spell Check, um, and it increased overnight by 5x. And it allows you, it's all now across everything that we do in Microsoft Office, pretty much including Visio, which is our flow chart part of Office. And it allows you to check your, your whatever it is, an email, a Word document, and make sure that it's accessible before you send it out. Right? Incredibly important. And we're going to be working more on this one. So watch this space. This is, a, this is a cool one that's getting some work on it right now. Another one that's come out of this work is Presentation Translator. And this brings in artificial intelligence. Don't think about robots. Think about the good side of AI. Um, and this is how you can bring artificial intelligence to give you real-time captioning. In fact, it's so accurate that while my wonderful, incredible interpreter, who will never be replaced by tech, trust me, because uh, I get so much out of ASL, um, but it gives that extra independence because the quality of the captions are so good. And it's now embedded into PowerPoint. So you can click one button and have English to English. Or you could just log into it from your phone and pick any language you want. It, just, it doesn't work just for people with disabilities. It works for everyone. And AI is beginning to have a big influence on everything that we do. AI is helping us with alt text. Five years ago, I did a bit of a survey to see what the most common alt text was on some of our document repositories. And you guys will laugh. Um, I'm predicting. But the most common alt text was, this is a picture. I think, I mean, you, right? So we've got to... What we're now doing is using AI. So now we, you know, we, we educate humans on how to write alt text, right? And we're educating and educating on how to write good alt text. But technology can help. With image recognition, you can now put your picture into PowerPoint or into Word, and narrator will automatically go down the page and add in what it thinks the alt text is if it isn't in there. Um, and it will tell you how good it thinks it is and give you the ability to edit it. Um, so AI can help. It will never replace, but it can help. And when you start combining this and our work that we've been doing on Narrator and the work that we are doing on magnification, color blindness filters that are now in Windows, if you think about eye control, we, you can now move a mouse and scroll a mouse. Uh, using just your eyes and a very small $150 device. If you've got deafness going on, you can use translator to understand what someone's saying. You can also use dictate functions right within Office that if you speak into it, it will write it on the page. We're starting to create a more inclusive environment. And if I think about a table full of kids in a classroom, I can imagine Hopefully, with what we have now, let alone what's coming down the pipe, that kids like me when I was younger and many others will be able to sit around a table and not have to disappear off for specialized education. Um, while that's incredibly valuable, you can sit around and be inclusive with your friends, just using your technology and your way to access whatever's in front of you. There's an incredible power that technology, I hope, 
can bring. And that's the vision and what keeps us driven. And then I'll close up by talking about innovation for one minute. And I think we'll have maybe a couple of minutes for questions. I, I know we're running a little hot on time. Um, but just a couple of uh, examples on innovation. You know, that hackathon I mentioned, um, and one of the big drivers and motivators in the company uh, is just creating new wicked stuff, new crazy stuff. We love cool toys. Um, who doesn't? Uh, but it motivates people. We actually started hacking in 2014. And in 2014, I had 10 projects and 75 people hacking on ability hacks. That included eye gaze. And that was the first time that we really invested in that space. And in two days, with no light, coffee, a lot of duct tape, <laughs> duct tape is very important, we created an eye gaze wheelchair, moving a wheelchair with just your eyes. And we thought that was amazing. Last year, same hackathon, which we do for a week every year, I had 150 projects and 850 Microsoft employees hacking. Um, and some of the projects that have come up, well, you might know one of them, Seeing AI. Seeing AI was a hackathon project. And in fact, I'll tell you that the, uh, the, the hack team first put this project and they walked around with cameras taped to their heads. And we all thought they were slightly bonkers. Um, but that's what they did. They walked around Microsoft cafeterias with phones taped to their heads, seeing if they could read the menus. And that was, that was what they did in the hackathon. Seeing AI with a year's work launched last summer. Um, we've now had over 3 million interactions using Seeing AI and over 130,000 people have the play. None of us, none of us anticipated this, but it is all based on AI. You know, some of the stuff that we launched a couple of months ago, and if you haven't played with this, do play. Um, handwriting, colors, currency, um, and you, all of those channels are now available. Uh, and it's, it's such an exciting area for us, and I can't wait to see uh, what we do next here. But there is one other example that actually came out of where I am in London. In fact, one of the greatest times I ever had was in Paddington, London, demoing this project a few years ago. And back then, it was just really an idea. But we launched this one a couple of, uh, in fact, a few weeks ago. Let me play this one and, and let you give a sense. This is Soundscape. A busy city street. Maya with her guide dog. Good boy, steady. Steady, good boy. Aaron Lauridson, Lighthouse, San Francisco. We want to explore our world in the same ways that everybody else wants to explore their world. Outdoor. Donning a headset. Soundscape fills in a lot of the mental map as you move. It makes it effortless and seamless to know what's around you because it's designed such that you can just put it in your pocket and go. Maya using Soundscape, walking with Alex. DSW Shoe Warehouse. DSW Shoe Warehouse. Cool things happening around town here. <laughs> when I'm with other people, I'm able to gather a lot of the same information my sighted friends or family are getting from the signage around me. And with that, I'm able to participate in, hey, look, what's over there? Disigual. Oh, Disigual is showing up here as well, which is one of my favorite stores. Oh, really? Yeah. Those moments that don't usually happen for me in my life. David, walking in the park. Using the technology is relatively easy. You have to still concentrate on listening for obstacles, but you then get used to the chatter in the background and you can pick out suddenly something that's of interest to you. Shona, around town. It was great telling me all the different shops as I passed, which is lovely. And the different street names as well. Quite often I don't know, you know, which street's which. Approaching intersection, Bathory goes right. Maya, touching phone screen. We have a, a beacon set for Nike Store, 248 yards. The beacon has been helpful 
in approaching different addresses and places in busier areas. Arm extended, pointing with her phone. I'm getting the bell right about here. Great, so let's just head off that way. Okay, forward. Passing through an open market. It's been a unique experience to work with the Soundscape team. They have been so transparent, forthcoming, open to feedback. It's been a really dynamic relationship. You have blind people on your team, you're working deeply with agencies like Lighthouse and reaching out and engaging with blind people in different places and from different backgrounds and really making sure that what's being created is aligned with the needs of the community. Ah, Fiddler forward. Naki store. Good boy. Left inside. Entering the store. Woohoo! Okay. Hi, how are you today? Logo of Guide Dogs UK. Logo of Lighthouse, San Francisco. Microsoft, empowering every person to achieve more. Thank you so much. So, you know, and I will say that both those projects started, um, seeing AI started with an architect here in London who's blind. Soundscape started as a project of another architect who's blind called Amos Miller, um, uh, who was also based here in London. He's now based over in Redmond. And so it speaks and comes full circle. Having people with disabilities at the core of what ev everything that we do produces things like this. There's a lot more that we need to do, but I'm excited about where we are. So with that, I'm not sure where we are in time. I don't know if we have time for any questions, but I'm game on if you do. Um, if not, I will give you our simple, um, my Twitter, which don't laugh, is Jenny Lay Fluffy. Um, and also, yeah, our, no, I saw that. Um, and also our broad company one, which is MSFT Enable, which are our two Twitter accounts. Um, and also Disability Answer Desk is a great way uh, to get hold of us with any questions uh, that you have. Yes. So with that, let me stop talking. Yes, Jenny. Uh, hello, my name is Mike, and um, I gathered, I'm here with uh, 250 New York nerds, of which I am the 249th, and so thank you very much for, for this. I, what I did before the conference is I, I went around and, and gathered only about 65 questions for you, of which I'm going to uh, give you about three. All the other 62 will be sent to you, and I'm sure we'll be able to get, get through uh, uh, with, with you. Um, a couple of things themes came through as I talked to our attendees. And well, one of the themes was really having to do with the extent to which accessibility features are really baked into Microsoft and, and, uh, and all of the Microsoft products, uh, particularly making sure that the icons are on the desktop, front and center, and really are available and, and people can, can uh, perceive them, can uh, see them, can whatever, and get it very quickly. And kind of a related question to that, I guess the question really is, to what extent are changes that we can anticipate for Microsoft going to impact the ability uh, for accessible software to be as accessible as it needs to be? No, great question. Um, you, oh my god, there's so many different ways I could answer that. So. I will say that every product that we have, I mean, there's about 60 plus different permutations of Office, for example, and Windows launches twice a year. Uh, very different. You know, things are moving a lot quicker in the technology world than I say they, they did do when I first joined the company. Um, but every time that we launch, everything is rigorously checked. Now, do we, do we miss things occasionally? Of course. Um, and, you know, that does happen. And we really do encourage people, if you are at all technically nerdy, early adopter, if you're comfortable with slight bugs and issues, do join our insiders community, uh, which is where you get the first revs of the product even before they go to market. Uh, because then you can help us to see things. You know, we test across the spectrum of disability, in particular a lot of depth on screen reader use um, and magnification use. Uh, and high contrast, but you know, clearly we do check stuff before it comes out, because uh, our goal is to ensure that every version we have doesn't just meet legal bar, it goes way beyond, right? We're all about usability of what we're doing. So whether it's Excel, Sway, PowerPoint, Xbox, uh, Windows, uh, and some of our enterprise products coming through, we really do want you to be able to trust 
what we're putting out. Um, and so that also then means that when we do have those products coming out, uh, we put all of the information on the website. And I would also suggest keeping an eye on our blogs because all of the roadmaps I try to publish ahead of time, as do many of my the community of leaders across the business that I work with. Um, and so you'll actually find roadmap blogs that call out things coming up in the future. One of the things coming up is we're making it easier for you to be able to find and turn on and turn off accessibility. So you will be able to, this is in the uh, full release, uh, you'll be able to activate all of the accessibility features by using Cortana, um, our speech recognition engine. Um, and in the meantime, it's Windows Key U. Windows Key U is the shortcut. Um, and then you can bring everything up. So there's a lot more that we want to do to make it easier to find, easier to use. Um, but I really want trust. I, you know, and that means a big responsibility uh, for us and the incredi you know, incredible folks I work with back at base. Okay, and I'll, I'll just do, because time is of, uh, shortening, shortening right now, I'll, I'll just give one more question, but I, I'll, it's sort of a fill-in-the-blank question. Many people ask, are, are curious about when certain products are going to be available, and the one that I heard many times over and over is Office for Mac. Um, many people are curious about Office uh, for the Mac. Is that going to be uh, in, in the, on the Microsoft horizon? Office for Mac is out today. Office 365, check it out. It's it's great for accessibility. The, I yeah. Am I missing? I if I'm missing something. Okay. I we'll, thought you we'll, were going to ask we'll me for like when's the next version of Xbox coming? Well, in which case you'd have got no. I can't answer that. No, we're more basic um, than that. Okay. But Office for Mac, um, Office for the iPhone, Office for Android, Office for desktop are all out today. And I do stress the best version for accessibility. Windows 10, Office 365. Okay, and then lastly, um, why is Edge not more accessible? Microsoft Edge. It is. Um, <laughs> it is. Um, we, we, we worked on that. Um, now, is it perfect? No, there are definitely some things we're still working on, but whether you're using it with JAWS, NVDA, Narrator, all three. Oh, thumbs up. Um, now, was it two years ago? No, we've definitely had to work and address that, and we did get feedback. But try Edge. Um, and I stress, there are a few things we're still on it, um, but you know, let me know your feedback. I am all ears that they are deaf, but I do read. <laughs> Well, we will, we will send you, I will be sending you the other 63 questions that we weren't able to get through today. Thank you very much. That's great. I have a very long flight. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, London. Thank you, Joe and Victor and Mike and friends. Bill, we don't have any announcements, right? Okay, the, so the morning workshops will start at uh, 10.45, you said, right? 10.45. Thank you, everybody, for your participation today. Go and take action.
Hello, my name is Professor Heather Schultz. I teach speech communication at Brew College. I'm also a proud alumna of Brew College, and I'm here today with Hi world, uh, my name is Nefertiti Matos. I'm an assistive technology instructor for the New York Public Library at this time. And we're here today to share our thoughts on Jenny LaFlores, Chief Accessibility Officer at Microsoft, her inspiring speech. So Nefertiti, uh, yes. what, do you, what do you think about her inspiring talk? Oh my goodness, I think it was, it was beyond inspiring. Um, I, she herself, her presentation, I found to be very witty. She is very expressive, charming in, in her delivery, very informative. I, as an accessibility instructor, uh, as accessibility technology instructor, excuse me, learned quite a bit about Microsoft initiatives, both in the works and, com you know, in, in process. Um, she mentioned Seeing AI and Soundscape, both apps made and um, developed by blind engineers, which is wonderful. I'm a firm believer in, um, you know, anything about us, with us in mind, anything by us, for us, that kind of thing. So that was really exciting to learn that the engineers are blind themselves. Um, in case anybody's wondering, Seeing AI and uh, Soundscape are both free apps that you can get in the um, iOS App Store. And uh, they are fantastic. I could go on and on about them, but I'll give it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Nefertiti. I thought it was interesting. So Jenny Leifler was discussing how there are 110 people with disabilities at Microsoft and how that we need to build the collective of people with disabilities in the workforce. Do you have any ideas how to do so and raise that employment rate for people with disabilities? Well, I think she broached it very, very, um, I guess, correctly, and she hit the nail right on the head. If you want more people in the workforce, then maybe the key is to provide tools that they can use independently so that they can reach those goals, right? Make the technology, make the workspaces accessible so that people with disabilities can access them. We are one of the most educated populations there are, yet our, our job availability, and because of stigma, because of stereotyping, whatever the case is, implicit bias, whatever, really holds us back and one of the ways I think to even the playing field is through technology because our education and definitely our desire to succeed is already here. What else which I thought was what else what I thought was interesting was she was saying that when they're designing a product that they think about accessibility from the beginning and as an avid Microsoft user that really makes me really happy. How does that make you feel? Oh, it, it thrills me because rather than being some afterthought quick fix, you know, once the complaints come in and once people with disabilities productivity has been interrupted to like the 10 million, per, you know, power or what have you, it's already ready made. You can, and by you I mean the person with the disability, can purchase this product and use it with the assurance that you will have access to it like anyone else, rather than again being some stopgap measure after your productivity has been, you know, just sort of derailed simply because you don't have this equal access to the technology as everyone else. That's really unfair. So it was very exciting to hear that they're building from the ground up with accessibility in mind. So Jenny LaFleury was also talking about Microsoft's inclusion approach across company culture, the products, investing into the future. What do you think about that and how can that move on to other industries besides technology? Well, again, I think it was wonderful. I was really, really um, encouraged by how she presented and by the things she was saying that are, you know, in the works and coming. If seeing AI, again, a free app in the App Store, um, that really within one app you access about six, seven different crucial things like currency identification, um, color identification, OCR, which is the ability to snap a picture and, and have 
some, you know, inaccessible print material now being spoken to you out loud by a synthesizer and other, other, a lot of other, um, uh, a lot of other features, excuse me, within that one app where before we would have to download tons of apps and try them out and see if they work the way they promised. Now we have this one app backed by this huge world known and renowned company and I think that if Microsoft is investing in us and keeping us, the disabled community, you know, in their, in their crosshairs, if you will, and catering to us and understanding that we are a viable population, um, then I hope, I trust that other companies uh, within other industries will follow suit. Because again, if this huge company is taking the time and the effort to invest in us and to consider us as uh, you know, people who can make them money, if nothing else, um, then I think that's very encouraging to other companies and they too will follow suit. I thought, also thought it was interesting how Jenny Leifler was talking about removing the sti stigma as children and separating children from their friends into specialized classes. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's great. As she said, there is value in, in this method, I, I happen to think there is some value, but I also think and firmly believe that what we want is equality, like any other minority group, any other marginalized uh, folks in the world. What we want is to have a seat at the table, right? Not just appreciate the crumbs that fall from it. So rather than separating the child with a disability, into a group with other children with disabilities, why not put them in the same classroom so that they have, you know, the opportunity, excuse me, the opportunity to thrive like any other student, have the same access to um, the education that is being given through the technology that's accessible to everyone, right? Like when I use my iPhone, when I first got an iPhone in 2008, it changed my life. I had the same phone as my sister, as my cousins, as just about everyone else. And I felt like, wow, so this is what it means. This is how it feels to be a part of something, to belong to something, to be just like everyone else. I know we're supposed to be individuals, etc., but sometimes it feels good to have the same thing that everyone else has, whether or not you use it in the same way. So this idea of a more inclusive teaching environment, more inclusive education, where everybody is at the same place at the same time, whether or not they're using the tools at their disposal in the same way, as long as they're getting it done and they're learning, then yes, I'm all for having everyone together. Thank you so much, Nefertiti. So you're basically saying that it's a matter of human rights. So, oh, yes. so when is this movement happening for your community? When is it happening? I'd like to think it's been happening. It's happening right now. These types of conferences here, the, the CCVIP conference, which by the way is very excitingly, um, Dean Clarkson announced today that it's being renamed the Karen L. Gorgi conference. That was very touching because Karen is wonderful. Um, this conference is, is one of those ways, bringing up the awareness, raising awareness, as you said, that it is a human rights issue. Um, and that it, it's something that needs and should continue to be done. Um, and I'm hopeful that it will continue because this isn't something, you know, that just like, when does this happen and snap everybody, you know, everybody's in the same classroom, accessing the same uh, stuff in theaters or airplanes or et cetera. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of advocacy. It takes a lot of breaking down those barriers that we are people too. And, you know, conferences like this, consumer organizations like the National Federation of the Blind and um, American Council of the Blind advocacy groups for and by blind people are making great strides through, uh, for this through legislation, etc. So it takes a lot of hard work, but it's getting done. And someday, I don't know, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, like I was saying, I'm very hopeful that this forward momentum will continue and that this will become a more inclusive world day by day. Thank you so much for your time, Nefertiti, and thank, thank you, you for tuning into the live stream today.
start? Okay. Hello, everybody. Hey. Let's let's get started. Um, hi, I'm Iris Rosen, and I'm a member of the CCVIP Advisory Board for many years, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker um, in private practice. And um, let's see. Um, we, we, I want to thank the conference sponsors, the Computer Center for Visually Impaired, the New York State Commission for the Blind, Rosinki, Rosinki and Associates, Hidden City Cafe, the Jolson Foundation, and the North National Australia Bank Limited. Um, I'm supposed to remind everybody to put their cell phones on mute or vibrate, okay? And I'm going to give you the bios for our two um, presenters today. Um, Wale's bio is that he was born in Egypt and raised in New York. Wale has significant tr transitions in his life, first from one country to another, and then through varying degrees of vision. As a digital accessibility coordinator, Wally makes sure that the city of New York's digital products can be accessed by all, whether it's by conducting website audits, providing staff awareness trainings, or representing the disability community in his everyday life wherever he goes. Wale is constantly changing perceptions one, such, one situation at a time. Did I pronounce your name right, I hope? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, and then Jonathan is the outreach manager from the New York City Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. As outreach manager, he is responsible for creating digital and print media content to support office initiatives and events. He also manages the office website and social media accounts. So um, I understand that they're going to talk and alternate, and we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for questioning. So if you guys can hold your questions till the end, that would be great, OK? So let's welcome them. And I, 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 it's nice to have this many people here for this presentation. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, thanks to Karen, Bill, and the team at CCVIP for inviting us to speak. So uh, we like to start with what's called an access check. This is something that's been um, happening in a lot of disability events. So am I speaking loud enough? Yeah. Awesome. Am I speaking too fast? No. Awesome. And yorker. for your benefit, <laughs> <laughs> um, and for your benefit, we will be describing the images in our presentations, um, and we will also describe ourselves. So I am five foot eleven. I'm Middle Eastern, I have dark hair, brown eyes, I'm wearing a striped blue shirt, and gray pants. I'm also sporting a black cane. Here's John. Good morning. <laughs> it's relative. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Novick. I am a little person. Um, I'm about four feet tall. I am currently wearing a, uh, a blue button-up, blue pants and brown shoes, although you can't see them because I'm behind a podium. So, uh, am I speaking loud enough? Yes. Am I speaking too fast? No. All right, hopefully it doesn't speed up as I go. So, um, currently we're looking, I'm gonna be describing all of our slides before we you know, talk about them individually. So, this is our general slide format for our office, the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. In the top left, there's our logo. In the top right, there's a number of accessibility icons that have to do with normally accommodations that you'd find at an event. The first one is a person in a wheelchair, notes physical accessibility. The second is uh, someone who is using a white cane. So noting um, you know, blind, low vision access. The middle is an um, uh, icon for Braille, noting that there would be Braille um, materials available, materials available in Braille. The next one is a hearing loop or assistive listening, sorry, not a hearing loop, but assistive listening device. It's an image of an ear with wave lengths, like sound waves coming out of it. And the final one are two hands um, making what looks like two okay symbols, like your index finger and your thumb coming together, and this notes ASL interpretation would be available. In the middle of the slide is our logo, once again, and our website, which is nyc.gov slash disability. We're going to be talking today a lot about the work that our office does, some of the policies and programs that we've been working on, and a number of resources. And we encourage you to, if not ask questions to us now, check out our website. We have a contact sheet that's available both in large print and braille currently uh, on the table in front of the podium uh, at the front of the room. Right now, we're going to be moving it to the general table after this presentation, but we have a list of contacts for specific um, members of our office as well as um, specific program websites that we're going to be speaking about. So 
the New York City Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities does a number of things. First, we are a referral agency. So what that means is people will call us, people will email us, people will angrily tweet at us questions and issues that they're having, and we try and assist them the best we can by providing information to resources. This is uh, ranges from housing programs to um, transportation, like a reduced fare metro card or a parking permit. Uh, benefits, we provide information on how to go about applying for benefits and what benefits you might qualify for and um, as well as employment. In addition to that, we're also a policy office. So we work to make sure that the voice of the disability community in New York City is represented in everything the city is doing. And this includes also working with city council members and other, um, other folks to bring about legislation that can assist the disability community. And we're gonna be talking about that as we go. And then finally, we have um, two programs that are uh, actually pretty robust that come out of our office. The first is a program called Project Open House. This is a program that is a home modification program for people with disabilities living in New York City. This is something that you can apply for and we'll do kinds of accommodations, I'm sorry, um, renovation projects that can assist people with disabilities living more independently in their own home. So this would naturally, people start to think of like adding ramps, adding um, you know lifts and things, but also we work with each individual person. So for example, uh, there was a woman who was low vision and she had trouble coming home at night because her stairs needed to be, they were very jagged and crumbling as well as um, her, she had a, like a metal key and a lock for her door. So what we actually did was we went in and we uh, renovated the stairs, made the brand new, put in a handrail for support, and then actually swapped out her locks for like a remote control key fob so it was easier for her to get in. So the program really varies, so we highly encourage everyone to check it out. And you can find out more information on that at nyc.gov slash POH, as in Project Open House. And the other program we have is called NYC at Work, and it's a employment initiative that I'm going to be getting into a little bit more later. Just so, uh, somebody asked, what, can you repeat that URL for POH? Oh, yes. Um, NYC.gov slash POH, as in Project Open House. NYC.gov slash POH. Okay. So that's a little bit of information about our office. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over now to my colleague, Wally Sabri. All right. Uh, so I forgot to mention earlier that I'm really excited to be here for a few reasons. I was actually once a CCVIP student where I learned, uh, I took co courses on Microsoft Access and PowerPoint and, and research and advocacy and those things um, gave me the tools to get started and, and you know, helped me get to where I am today. So I'm, I'm thankful to be here. And also I was, uh, I briefly worked for CCVIP Almost 10 years ago, I presented at this conference. And finally, I'm a Baruch alumni, so I have a lot of reasons why this is a great place for me to be today. Um, so who am I? I'm Wale Sabri. I'm the Digital Accessibility Coordinator. And what that means is I'm tasked with helping city agencies make their digital content accessible. And I'll be explaining that in a minute. Let me uh, just step in and describe this slide. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, there's two images, one on the left, one on the right. The image on the left is actually a screenshot from nyc.gov's 311 website. And this is a website full of information and action that you can take. You can file complaints, you can check the status of a complaint, you can make payments, you can um, learn about business, education, environment, employment, resources that New York City has to offer. So this is just a screenshot of the website. On the right-hand side is an image of Wally um, on his computer using a headset um, doing the work that he does as a digital accessibility coordinator, which he will explain. All right, so in March of 2016, the mayor signed Local Law 26, which requires city agencies to make a reasonable effort to make their websites accessible. As part of that, the digital accessibility coordinator position was um, created. And uh, you guys uh, might remember Jenny talked about how having people with disabilities helps us make more accessible products in the mayor's office for people with disabilities. A lot of us do have disabilities, and that helps us improve the quality of our work. So I was hired as a digital accessibility coordinator, and I, um, I'm tasked with the following. So there are over 50 city agencies that have websites on nyc.gov, and there are over 300 websites on nyc.gov, and those websites are associated with 50,000 different pages. 
So it's not a lot of work, not at all. <laughs> um, so it's a tall order, obviously. And um, part of uh, the work that I do is auditing websites. So I will go on, let's say, um, the Department of Finance, full website, or emergency management, and I will test it, and I'll create a report and send it to the right people, and we'll start a process of going back and forth until those issues are remediated. And I have, currently have a spreadsheet on my computer. It has at least like 30 or 40 different websites that I'm working on. Um, so at uh, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, or do it as we like to call it, we manage all of, most of our websites, and we use a content management system called TeamSite. And that allows us to create a template or a shell for our websites to uh, be, for our websites, right? So uh, the Do It team is managing that template. Now each individual agency pours in the content. So let's use a metaphor of a building. If our nyc.gov is a building, do it is sort of like the landlord and management, and each individual agency are like the tenants that move in and make that space theirs and add all the things and content. So uh, there's a two, you know, it's a two prong approach, right? So we have to work on our template, and that's we have been doing that. We have been doing things like adding uh, support for alt text, right? Jenny uh, mentioned that earlier as well. And how many of you guys are JAWS users and and use headings? Awesome. So if you're a big fan of headings, our, our uh, temp new template that we're transitioning to has much better support for headings, so you can navigate with headings much easier. And, um, and we're also uh, talking to the content creators and making sure that they are including headings into the content that they create. Uh, we also make sure that there's keyboard access to all the links and the buttons, right? And, and we set up tools so that when content creators are creating forms, they're creating accessible forms and they have the tools necessary to do so. Um, so that's a little bit about um, the, the, the type of auditing that I'm doing. Um, and part of that is I get a lot of the same questions over and over again. So uh, in an attempt to sort of streamline the process, we've created some guides. Slide. Image description. Uh, there are six rectangles, noting guides, uh, and they are they read as follows: accessible social media guide, website accessibility guide, accessible documents guide, screen reader reference guide, accessible presentations guide, and PowerPoint guide. All right. So um, I've uh, I've worked to create different guides. Most of them we've been circulating internally, right? So how do you create a, uh, an accessible PowerPoint? So we stress the importance of things like including alt text in your PowerPoint, using accessible colors and having contrast, using accessible fonts, avoid using uh, having large blocks of text and using all caps, things like that. So we kind of break it down and make it easy to understand and follow for folks. And we distribute these to anyone who asks for them, but also we preemptively send it to folks that are creating an accessible content. Um, so uh, we, we also have uh, you know, document accessibility guide, web accessibility guide. Uh, we plan to finalize those and also make them public so we can share them with you guys and, and everyone um, who wants them. Uh, currently, our social media guide is public, so it's on our website. It can be downloaded, and it just explains on um, how to create accessible social media posts on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. So how to add alt text to your Twitter posts, how to add alt text to your Facebook posts, and how to add an image description on Instagram. Um, so we, we, uh, we find that these guides are helpful for folks and also help us save time. But um, to go along with these guides, we have also created some uh, trainings. New slide. Digital accessibility trainings. Image of Wally standing on a podium in front of a screen as an auditorium of people looks on. Kind of like right now. <laughs> um, and the, I believe that image has a slide oh, yes, in it Yes, sorry. As well. This is a, uh, now an image within an image because it's a PowerPoint within a PowerPoint. Um, the slide that is on the screen 
in the screen is a slide on forms. There are two images, two forms next to each other. On the left is your standard form that you would expect to interact with, with uh, a label and a text box and a label and a text box. And on the right is a very inaccessible form with text boxes all squished together in the top left of the screen without labels. So I find that uh, a human approach is very helpful. So we try to make people understand why the accessibility work matters, and we try to do that by showing what it's like to have something inaccessible to you. So those slides are showing what it's like to have a form that has no labels and, and is just hard to navigate and understand. In a similar way, I actually like to do this activity uh, when I start trainings by handing a sighted person a sheet of braille and asking them to read it. Um, and it is a lot of fun because they're like, you know, I, I don't know what this is, and I'm like, this is, you know, this is words, uh, you know, and they're like, oh. uh, I'll ask them, well, what, what can you read? You don't read Braille? What, what do you read? And then they're like, I read English. And I'm like, yeah, this is unified English Braille. Um, so I, I, I uh, try to sort of demonstrate what it's like to have something inaccessible to you and also, you know, go through the social aspect of it, of telling them, you know, um, uh, print, is that the thing with the ink? You know, like kind of like when they're like, you know, Braille, is that the thing with the bumps? Or people have actually asked me before um, calling sci uh, Braille sign language before, uh, it's happened. Um, and, uh, and also then I direct them to a form that I found on the internet that actually is screen reader accessible but has no visual labels. Uh, and that's also a lot of fun because I'll tell them, here, fill out your form. It says name right next to it, and they're like, I don't see it. Um, so, you know, we have fun with it, but we also sort of try to drive the point across that access is important, and it can be a, a bad experience for somebody. And it's also, it could be a daily experience for people with disabilities to have to experience, you know, go through these barriers and, and ask for things ahead of time and, and all of that. And we incorporate that into our practices. We were actually just at the Andrew High Scale Library yesterday, and we brought plenty of large print and Braille flyers, right? And they were, you know, we got a lot of good feedback in the end. So we also have Braille and large print flyers today. So be sure to pick one up. Uh, it has our contact info. Um, all right, so trainings, right? So we have created different types of trainings in different groups. Uh, we have a digital inclusion committee, which is a group of city professionals interested in uh, learning more about making their websites accessible. So we have had um, four or five different meet meetings so far, and our goal is to take the daunting task of web accessibility or digital accessibility and turn it into bite-sized lessons. So we started at the very beginning. We started with um, uh, a brief summary of the report that we published last year on our web accessibility, which is on our website. You can download it. Um, and explaining you know, what, where the state of our websites is at and also our plan to get to a place where we'd like to be with accessibility on our websites. Um, and we also covered, uh, taught them about the the guidelines that we use. So there is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0, which have been adopted internationally. Right? And we sort of break those down and explain to them that these are the guidelines that we're using and give them resources to follow up if they need to learn more about them. Right? And as we move towards the new guidelines 2.1, we are also looking forward to those and, and adopting those as well. Um, another topic that we covered is intro to assistive technology and how to use a screen reader to test the website so that our content creators and developers um, know a little bit about testing, right? Uh, so that they can maybe, you know, if they create a Word document or a PDF, that they can try to at least go read it with a screen reader and see if it's reading the alt text and things like that. Another one was alt text. So we had a whole one and a half hour session on alt text and image descriptions and just teaching folks how to technically add them, but also how to conceptually add them, right? How do you craft a good description of an image? And we created guidance around this. We gave them four simple questions to answer, which is basically, where is this taken? How many people are in the photo? What are they doing? And what's the importance of this photo? And answering those four questions, we find, will help you craft a good description. 
Um, and our final uh, topic, which was last month in March, we uh, had a whole session on creating accessible forms. And uh, we focused particularly on the platform that we used, TeamSite. So we showed them exactly how to make an accessible form and what they need to include. So that includes you know, making sure it has keyboard accessibility, making sure it has text labels, um, and um, making sure that the required fields are noted in an accessible way, whether it's a star or using ARIA, and um, error validation. So if somebody made a mistake in the form, they should be able to get some kind of simple message on what they did wrong and how to fix it, right? So um, that's the Digital Inclusion Committee, and we're going to continue to have these bite-sized classes for uh, city employees and we're going to cover things like maps and um, how to work with large sets of data and color contrast and, and, and other topics as well. So I've also been doing some uh, dig intro to digital accessibility trainings for agencies specifically. So uh, right now, for instance, I'm talking to city planning and they're interested in having me come in and do a digital accessibility training for their marketing and communications team and their developers. So uh, this is a great thing because we also get to tailor the training to what their needs are. So if they want to learn about websites, we can talk about, I can do that. We can, if they want to cover web apps, we can cover that. Or if their spe uh, specific interest is in documents, we can cover that. We've also done trainings on audio description uh, and captioning for videos. Um, so those uh, are happening as well. We've started doing uh, trainings at Do It uh, for content creators. So those are the people that are actually uh, not managing the template themselves, but actually putting the content in there. So the words, the images, the colors, right? So making sure that they're including headings, making sure that they're good in, uh, putting in good alt text for their images, uh, making sure that they're using accessible colors and fonts. Um, and so on and so forth. And these, these are actually happening on a weekly basis. There's a, a, around two or three of those trainings happening a week at Do It. And therefore, you know, uh, they're small intimate trainings for about four or five people at a time. So they kind of get that individual attention and get to ask all the questions that they need so that they learn how to make their websites accessible. Um, next slide. So this is an image of a room full of people uh, in a few different rows of tables to having discussions over food. The text on the bottom says accessibility events, and the text in the middle says digital access and inclusion. All right, so we find that teaching people things takes a lot of repetition. So we've taken all the stuff that we've done and added on to it, and we're actually organizing a one day, uh, a day long conference for our city employees around 150 of them. It's going to be in May 17th on Global Accessibility Awareness Day, where we're going to cover a lot of the same topics that we've already covered and new ones. So um, just you know, more of the same in terms of like just making sure that we're really drilling this into people's heads. Next slide. So I'm going to describe this slide in a second. So obviously, we've been talking a lot about what we have been doing to work with city agencies to ensure that they are creating accessible content. We've created guides, we have worked, we've created trainings and we've held events, and we have started to see, or we have been seeing more and more results of people actually um, internalizing this training. So this is an image of a social media post. On the left is an image that was posted on Facebook. On the right is the text that accompanied it. So I'm actually gonna read the text on the right first. This is from New York City Emergency Management, February 15th. Oh no, say it ain't snow. It's been a mild day today, but we are looking at a return to winter weather this weekend. If you are traveling during this long weekend, stay safe. Image description, if you must travel during winter weather, exercise caution, allow for extra time and anticipate delays. Use mass transportation whenever possible. If you have to drive, drive slowly and use major streets or highways. These roadways will be cleared first. NYC.gov slash emergency management. So that's one example of city agencies, huge shout outs to New York City Emergency Management and Department of Transportation, DOT. They have been doing, they've been taking the lead, I think, on internalizing these accessibility um, image descriptions and making sure that they're so 
social media is accessible and more and more gaining steam, but we are seeing results in our correspondence from our city partners, our uh, fellow city agencies. So not only this, but in videos as well. Um, Wally and I have also been working to make sure that video content is accessible as well, not only through subtitling, you know, captioning, but audio description. So if it's okay with everybody, I'm just gonna play a little clip from a video that uh, New York City Emergency Management put together. Disabilities, access, and functional needs. Inside an apartment, a woman pours herself a glass of water. The storm is scheduled to make a direct hit on New York City, which will result in dangerous storm surges, category five level winds, and widespread power outages. She looks at her TV. A mandatory evacuation for residents in zone one and two is expected, and you can visit NewYorkCity.com for the evacuation This is a center. message from New York City Emergency Management to Alex Guerra. You have been assigned to work at sheltering system Q01. You will report to the evacuation center at Townsend Harris High School, located at 149-11 Melbourne Avenue in Queens. The first shift begins at 8 a.m. on August 30th. Thank you for your support of New York City and its residents. She hangs up and dials another number. Hey, Mom. So this is a 13-minute video. I imagine we probably can't do the whole thing. Um, I think that it got a little bit clipped in the beginning. I'm, I apologize for that. But this is actually a video, a fully audio-described video of um, emergency shelter information that New York City Emergency Management has put out. And this is we've worked with them to create uh, audio description and taught them so we don't have to assist them every time, but they will be continuing to do this. Um, and same thing with the uh, Department of Transportation. So if you want to check out the remaining 13 minutes of this very riveting video, you can go to nyc.gov slash emergency management and learn about shelters because that's and, very important. And unlike Microsoft, we don't get to hire a team just to focus on audio description. So we have to do what we can in terms of just teaching all these different agencies and communications team to do it and then revisiting it and revisiting it, it until, you know, they do it. So, um, but also, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we are promoting a culture of, of accessibility within city government with all our trainings and guides. And some of the results of that is, like I said, these trainings that are happening uh, every week. And a lot, some of these trainings are now not led by me. They're actually led by folks at Do It. There's actually a training happening right now without me on how to create accessible content for content creators. All right. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So we've talked a lot about accessible communication. And access is a very big part of the mayor's office for people with disabilities. We want to ensure that all city information, city resources is accessible. And this doesn't just stop at the actual communication, but extends further into that, into the actual city agencies themselves. So this image, um, there's two images next to each other. On the left-hand side, there's Mayor Bill de Blasio signing a bill um, f uh, surrounded by a few council members. And on the right-hand side, there's a number of city um, agency logos, New York City Emergency Management, New York City Human Rights, Department of Homeless Services, NYPD, and several others. At the bottom, the title is Disability Service Facilitators. So as a result of Local Law 27 of 2016, each city agency is now required to appoint what's called a Disability Service Facilitator. Now what this is, is a point of contact uh, a public-facing point of contact for the community to address disability-specific issues. So they not only are responsible for, you know, this kind of correspondence, but ensuring that their agency is within, um, you know, compliance and is striving toward compliance. Now, um, th these points of contact are not just, um, you know, public-facing figures, which they are, uh, but they are a network of you know, colleagues of ours that we meet with routinely and update on best practices, not only on accessible communication, but how to make their agency more accessible. Now, I want to note that every single point of contact on this, um, every single disability service facilitator for each agency has a public-facing point of contact, which is available at nyc.gov slash dsf. That's nyc.gov slash DSF. DSF as in Disability Service Facilitator. So this means that if you have, let's say, a disability-specific issue with HPD, there's a DSF for that. If you have a disability-specific issue with Taxi and Limousine Commission or NYPD or Emergency Management or Human Rights or 
with over 50 agencies, there is a specific point of contact that is public facing available at nyc.gov slash DSF. And that's, there's both a phone number and an email of the person that you can get in contact with. So in addition to that, so the uh, new slide, Accessible Meeting Notice Guide. On the left-hand side, there's a, a booklet that says Meeting Notice Guide. And on the right, there's a, an image of a physical, accessibility, um, a physical accessibility icon, person in a wheelchair, and a sentence that says, for accommodation requests, please contact blank. So uh, in 2016, Local Law 28 was passed. A lot of good local laws in 2016, uh, which was a, a law that was passed that pertain to adding accessibility information into public events that were being held by city agencies. So if a city agency is holding a public event, it doesn't matter if it costs money or if it's free, if it's open to the general public, they are required to add accessibility information on all of their advertisements about what will be available at that event. So this starts with physical accessibility. You know, you could say, you know, saying that the event will be um, held in a physical location, a physically accessible location, an accessible restroom, but also the availability of such things as, um, you know, a Braille or um, audio description. In certain cases, we work with, you know, Department of Cultural Affairs. There might be like an art exhibit that's being held, so like tactile tours, uh, touch guided tours, and things like that. So these are that's just one small example of like what is at first needs to be uh, available. Second is a point of contact for um, individuals to reach out to, to ask questions and to make accommodation requests. So you can reach out and ask for the availability of these things or make a request that all the materials are available in Braille or the videos that are being played do have audio description. So this is um, something that we have been educating people. We have created an accessible meeting notice guide that's available on our website that teaches city agencies and anyone, really, everyone, hopefully, how to go about doing this and the best practices for it because we want to make sure all events that are being held in New York City are available and open to everyone in New York City, and this is how we start doing that. And we need your help with that. If you do see an advertisement, if you counter an advertisement by a city agency for a public event that doesn't have this information, get in touch with us let us know so we can correct that yes thank you hmm? oh we're, so, we're not done we're so well, in, in, <laughs> what'd you say <laughs> okay well in addition to that a great way to do that is the previous slide the disability service facilitators so if you see that there's an event being held by a city agency that doesn't have this information you can reach directly to the disability service facilitator and tell us too, we want to help also, but you know. Um, okay, so this next slide um, is accessible dispatch. On the right, on the bottom right, there's an image of a gentleman who is uh, shaking hands with a person who is in a wheelchair standing in front of a taxi cab. Uh, so uh, on the left hand side, there's some text that describes what accessible dispatch is. It's a wheelchair accessible taxi service. It services customers in all five boroughs 24 seven on demand and reserved. And you can find out more information at AccessibleDispatch.com. So Accessible Dispatch is a you know, wheelchair accessible taxi service that you can order at any time to come to the front of your door, which is great um, because it's, you know, it's, it's um, TLC. I'm talking about yellow and green cabs specifically that are offering wheelchair accessible forms of transportation. You can, you can reserve a cab and call a cab to you by dialing 311. You can visit their website, AccessibleDispatch.com, or you can download the app, their app, Accessible Dispatch, on Google Play or the App Store on your iPhone. And uh, part of the work that I do is to making sure that those things are accessible, the website and the app. And we're currently going through them with the folks at MTM, the vendor, to make sure that they fix things so that they are screen reader accessible and accessible using accessible colors and fonts and things like that. Now you might be saying, well, I don't need a wheelchair accessible cab, I'm a blind person. You don't have to be a wheelchair user to use this service. Anyone can call a cab uh, and that cab will come and pick them up where they're at and take them to their destination. You can book a cab, it just has the added benefit of you know, give, uh, uh, um, providing a wheelchair accessible cab. They also have cabs that have induction loops. So for those who have hearing disabilities, you can request a specific cab that uses an induction loop so you can use your hearing aid or um, uh, whatever device they use. Great, thank you, Wally. 
So this next slide is an image of a woman who is using a white cane who is crossing a street um, in the middle of Manhattan. You have the audio? And the bottom is Call for Innovations. And we have an audio clip that goes along with this image. Does this sound familiar? Hopefully that's a recognizable sound. So those are the accessible pedestrian signals. How many of you guys use them? <laughs> well, they're there for those who want to use them, right? So, um, so those are helpful. Some people find them helpful and some people don't, right? But we are trying to increase the amount of those that there are in the city. Unfortunately, the current infrastructure or the current vendor that we use, um, you know, places that in such a way where it's super expensive for us to do so. So we end up only installing around 75 to 100 a year, and there are thousands of intersections in New York City. So what we're doing about that is we're trying to innovate. In November, we put out a call for innovations to the tech community, right? We put, posed a, a problem to them, right? And, we, uh, and that problem is how do we create a cost-effective way for blind people to cross the street? And also, how do we invest in the future technology that is going to help blind people find their way around the city? So this could be an app, it could be a wearable, or it could be something in the infrastructure, right? But we focused on uh, creating this solution, and, and you know this will result in a pilot that will be happening in the next six months to a year on 23rd Street and 7th Avenue, and we will be. And we will be looking to you guys for testing, right? So we will be reaching out to you guys so that when it is installed, that you guys can test it and let us know what you think of it. I'm actually on the judging committee. We're choosing the finalists now. And uh, we're keeping a lot of folks in mind with this. We're not just focusing on the most high-tech solution or the power users. We're making sure that whatever the solution we come up with is inclusive of people with diff all sorts of um, abilities or, or ranges, right? So some people don't like to use smartphones, so our solution is not going to only be a smartphone solution, right? Some people don't have access to wearables, right? So we will be making sure that our solution is both affordable and accessible to a wide range of people in the blind community. So be on the lookout for that. Um, you guys might have also seen the Link NYC kiosks. Uh, or heard about them, those are replacing the phone booths. And, um, you know, just to be honest and upfront, when they first came out, they were not accessible, right? And there was uh, some legal stuff around that, right? So we helped the intersection team along with the NFB and we gave them feedback on how to enable talkback so that folks with, uh, who are blind can use them. So now, right now, if you walk up to any of these kiosks and plug in headphones, you, can, you will receive instructions on how to enable TalkBack. And we've been, even worked with them so that they've created um, keyboard shortcuts or keypad shortcuts so that if you don't want to use the screen, you can actually use the buttons to navigate around um, and get the information that you want from the kiosk. And it does um, have, um, it gives you uh, the ability to make free phone calls, right? So that's great. And that feature is accessible currently. You can also dial 911. Um, there are other apps on there like Google Maps and 311, which we are working on addressing in terms of accessibility because they don't work so well with TalkBack, and we're aware of that. So uh, that is what's going on in streets. Um, slide? Sure. So this slide is called NYC at Work. There is a, a logo, the NYC at Work logo. It's an apple with a silhouette of a cityscape. Uh, and the text reads, NYC at work. The first public-private partnership to create career pathways for New Yorkers with disabilities. Now, this is an employment program that launched about a year ago in our office that works to help people with disabilities, connecting people with disabilities with jobs. We have a business development council. We have a number of partners of agencies, well, not only city agencies, but public and private businesses um, um, Barclays Center, um, Jet handful Blue. of stuff. JetBlue, JetBlue is a very big one. Uh, Uniqlo. CVS, Uniqlo, uh, and, and, and lots and lots of others. So 
And on the other end, we have um, schools, we have colleges, public colleges, we have Baruch and a handful of other, all the other CUNYs uh, that we, that are, you know, working with people with disabilities to connect them with jobs. But it's not just for college students, it's for people with disabilities that are looking for gainful employment, whether that's a part-time position or a full-time position. This is a person-centered program. This is not just connecting a person with disability with any job and moving on, but focusing on the specific goals and the specific aspirations of the person with disability and giving them the resources to make them job ready and connect them with that job. If anyone is interested or in learning more about the program, in referring other people to the program, in becoming a part of the program for yourself, you can find out more information at nyc.gov slash at work. That's nyc.gov slash at work. And as my colleague mentioned before, we have a contact sheet, both available in large print and braille at the table in front of me, and it's gonna be the, available at the table with all the other handouts after our presentation, that has a handful of the URLs, the website addresses that we've been listing, as well as email addresses to get in contact with our um, the specific um, sections of our office. But that's nyc.gov slash at work. We highly encourage you to get involved. We'd love to have you. So we did have limited time today. We didn't get to cover everything that we wanted to cover, but um, everything that we do, uh, for you guys in the city every year, we publish in, a, in an annual report called Accessible NYC. And that comes out usually around the summertime. We've had three so far. And um, we, we, um, we basically include all of this information and more in terms of what we're doing to make this a more accessible city for people with disabilities. And it does cover all the areas including housing, transportation, access to city services, and education as well. So you can find out more about that and download the report at nyc.gov slash accessible NYC. So um, we have just a, a few more minutes before we open it up to questions. I just want to say a few more things. So um, we have one more program. This is actually a, well, this is actually a, a partnership with City Community um, Development, um, Citibank which is called Empowered Cities. Empowered Cities is a nationwide initiative to build financial security for people with um, people and families with disabilities. I'm sorry, let me describe the slide. It's Empowered Cities. It's an E and a C that's meant to look like a graph, like financial graph. Empowered Cities, building financial security for people, with, for people and families with disabilities. And the website address is empoweredcities.com. Now, this is another part of NYC at Work where we're gearing to build financial empowerment for, I'm sorry, not for, with people with disabilities, empowering people with disabilities to plan financially for their future. So this is, you know, it's, it's complicated. It gets very complicated. You know, if someone is, let's say, depending on benef benefits and social security and wants to re-enter the workforce and isn't sure how without jeopardizing their benefits, this is a program that can help you plan for that and navigate that chaotic environment because it is. So this is a, a new program of ours, and we're happy to be partnering with City. Our specific division is called Empowered NYC, but you can learn more at empoweredcities.com, E-M-P-O-W-E-R-E-D-C-I-T-I-E-S.com, empoweredcities.com. So that is pretty much the end of our presentation. One more plug. We have a Disability Pride Parade that's coming up. Has anyone marched in the parade previously? All right. All right. Great. So Disability Pride Parade. We are coming up on our fourth, I believe, our yep. fourth Disability fourth. Pride Parade, which is excellent. First year we had 3,000. Second year we had 5,000. Last year we had 7,500. This year we are looking for 7,501. <laughs> we want to build. We want to get bigger every year, and you could be that one. So please come out. Have a great time. It's going to be a And what is it, John? It's July 15th. That's on a Sunday. Uh, it's at 11 a.m. You and can find out more information at nyc.gov slash disability pride. Where, where do we march from to and to? Oh, we march from Union Square Park to Madison Square Park. It's July, July 15th. That's 15th. a Sunday. It starts at 11 a.m. Uh, July 15th. You can find out more information at nyc.gov slash disability pride. Now, Jonathan and Wally gave us a lot of information, so I'm sure some of you guys have some questions. So I wanted to make sure we had time for questions. Who has some questions? Hey, Lady uh, in the pink. Uh, um, Myra Iris, we yeah. microphones. Oh, there's microphones? If anyone who feels comfortable, you guys are going to pass the microphones? <laughs> <laughs> K 
Go ahead. Okay, lady in the pink. You want to say your name, by the way? Jewel Grant. Hi, Jewel. Hi. Um, you spoke about the project Open House. In regard to the project Open House, is, yes. is it a grant program in regard to fixing up your house or helping with your house, or how would that work? The project is funded. The, the project itself is funded by the the fe, um, federal block development grant. Federal. Community, Community Development, development block, grant. block Grant. Yes, that's how it's funded, but it, it is at no cost to the individual that is applying, if that answers your question. Yeah. As long as they meet the income requirements. There are requirements for the for Project Open House. So if anyone is interested, the process will be still, um, starting July 1st, 2018, for applications. It is a vast program, uh, and we you can actually reach it. If anyone has Project Open House questions, there's a... An uh, email, a specific email that you can actually address those questions to. It's poh at cityhall.nyc.gov. This is available on the handout that we have here. Um, okay. And so, where are the handouts? Oh, the handouts are right in front of the podium where I am at the front of the room. There are large print and braille um, handouts that have that information. We also have, we'll leave the handouts also in the vendor area as well. Okay. So, yeah. There's some other questions? Lots of questions. Okay, um, lady in the black sweater in the front, you. Want, want to say your name, please? Sure. Hi, my name is Barbara. Um, oh. Is there a general... <laughs> Wait. Okay, all right. Is there a general um, department, if you think you have legal issues, or just are interested in the legality of, of certain conduct, whether it's in your home or in your business, is there such a uh, phone so number if or you, department? If you, so it depends on the issue. So like okay. if you reach out to us with an uh, issue regarding housing, we might uh, share with you some legal resources like uh, housing court answers. Uh, but if, if it's a discrimination issue, then you can definitely file a complaint with the city commission on human How rights. How do you know if it's a discrimination issue? Well, if it's an issue that you think you're being targeted because of your disability or because uh, of your race or gender, right. then it's a discrimination issue. If it's an issue of somebody uh, or a landlord, let's say, not providing access right. uh, for you, that's a discrimination. What department would you call? That is the City Commission on Human Rights. You can get in touch with them by dialing 311. 311, yep. Thank you. You're okay, welcome. more questions here? Um, man in the gray sweater in the front. Hi, uh, I'm Rick Fox, and I'd like to know um, how we can find out, if, if we can find out uh, which streets are being either considered or designated for installation of audio traffic signals. Sure. So um, on the Department of Transportation website, they do have a list of the current uh, existing a APSs. You can also uh, contact their commissioner to request one in your area. Um, as well, on top of that, uh, you can get in touch with DOT or their mobility management team to find out more information. Okay, some more questions. I saw a bunch of hands. Um, in the middle with the black sweater. You, yeah. Okay. Hi. Oh, wait. I, I, got, I, I think I got her. Then I'll get you. Cool. We'll Sorry, make sure I Lynette too is many next. I people in black, you know? Sorry. <laughs> I'll get you next, I promise. Hi, I'm Kathy Beter. Um, you said you have a lot of um, material up there. I don't read Braille or see large print. Is there any way to get it in electronic format? Definitely. Sure. Um, maybe John can take your contact info. We can email that to you. Yep. Be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, black and pink. <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry, thank sweetie. Um, the kiosks. Can, oh, Lynette Tatum. Hi, Lynette. Hi, Lynette. Hello, all. <laughs> um, now, the kiosks, how do we find them if we're out in the street? Or do we go to the 311 and it'll give a list of locations? Thank you. you um you can always dial 311, but also um, I don't remember the, the website for the Link uh, NYC kiosks, but they do have a list of all of them there. Okay. Uh, so if you Google, you know, Link NYC or something like that. More questions? Um, all the way in the back, another black sweater person. <laughs> okay, in the middle there. Yeah, you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> 
Kathy Snapper. Uh, I hope this isn't off topic. I want to say that the city of New York and the state of New York have really been terrific. I've had great experiences dealing with the various agencies. Where I've had a terrible time is with the federal government, <laughs> ADA Act notwithstanding. And I'd like to touch on the expertise of the people in the room. Are there any points of contact if we're having trouble with a federal agency? I'm having terrible time with Department of Education, Department of Finance, and Social Security. Thank you. So, um, generally, you know, for federal government, we would recommend maybe reach out to the Department of Justice or the Access Board. Um, they're there for that reason. Um, in terms of what we're able to do as a city, you know, we're able to focus on making sure that city agencies are, you know, being accessible and providing services. No, I realize so. it's not your government's Yeah. trying to get the federal government to be responsive. Well, I mean, I, I would do what anyone else would do. I would reach out to the Department of Justice and put a complaint that way. We okay. also, on a more um, direct basis, we can also connect with you afterward to see if we can um, provide additional resources if you want to meet us after. We'd be happy okay, to do that. Okay, person um, in the red polo. <laughs> Hi, it's Fritz Latour. How y'all doing? Hey, uh, how are you? Uh, my question is really within the confines of the MTA slash access, uh, accessoride. Um, uh, does that fall within your purview? Accessoride. <laughs> um, accessoride, I mean, a stressoride is more like it. <laughs> That's what I said. Uh, uh, um, are you the agency, uh, could we go through you to? Lodge a complaint because, quite honestly, I feel as though we can certainly try to assist. MTA is a state agency. Uh -huh. We are in touch with them. We are constantly giving them feedback. Uh -huh. We do collaborate with them on certain projects. Um, so you know, but in terms of you know, we can only pass on information. We do complain. We do field complaints for Accessoride. So if you have a Accessoride complaint and you file it first with them and get a give us a oh, ticket number, we can follow up with them. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question because I think we're supposed to end at a quarter to 12. Does that sound right? So who would like to speak? Oh, there's a lady with a microphone. Go ahead, black and white and, or and orange. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Say uh, your name, please. My name is Eleanor Cohen, and I would like to know what you recommend we do about subtitles and making them accessible for people who can't read them. This happens in films frequently. Foreign films have been eliminated. I have not been able to find a way to compensate for it. It's a tremendous loss in, in, a, in the cultural and educational area. And it would also assist um, people who don't have disabilities, who might have trouble reading quickly. It requires a huge amount of skill. And as we know, whenever anything is done for the disabled community, it helps everybody. That is correct. And that's actually a great question. This is something that is, uh, has gotten some attention, you know, uh, or more work in access recently. So in terms of subtitles, um, you know, there, I have experienced audio description where uh, they, it's in a foreign language and, you know, there's two audio describers, one describing what's happening and one reading the subtitles. So that is uh, something that is there and it's an option. There's also iOS is now supporting the reading out of subtitles. So if you have an iPhone, you can have your subtitles read out loud by voiceover. Uh, iPhone. So if you have an iPhone, right, and you're watching a video on an iPhone that has subtitles, voiceover, the screen reader uh, that's built into the iPhone, can actually read them out loud. Now, I. Th I, I I think we're supposed to end at a quarter two, but you guys will be around for a little bit? We'll be around for a little bit. If you guys want to ask us some questions, we'll be in front here handing out some flyers if you haven't gotten one, and we'll be leaving flyers also in the and vendor And I just area. wanted to thank both Jonathan and Wally. They did a great job. Thank you guys so much for having us. Thank, thank you to CCVIP and, and Karen. Thank you for being here. And I wanted to mention that following this is the lunch and the awards um, part of it. And also, please visit the um, vendors after lunch, okay? Thanks, everybody, again.
Hi, my name is Heather Schultz. We just finished the Accessible in New York workshop at the conference and I am a professor at Baruch. I teach speech communication and also am a proud alumna of Baruch. And we have... Hi, I'm Dr. Gene Walkwin uh, with the PASS Coalition here in the city. We uh, try to make sure that the city streets remain accessible for blind and visually impaired people. Uh, I was a mobility specialist for about 25 years at the National Center on Deaf Blindness and uh, it's been a terrific conference so far. Thank, thank you, Gene. So given the amount of resources that we learned in this Accessible New York workshop, there's going to be a disability pride parade, there are many guides, there are trainings. What else would you like to see New York City do for the community? That's a really good question. Uh, I'm looking forward to marching in my next disability pride uh, parade. I have a visual impairment myself uh, and consider myself part of the community. I think one of the things that we want to do these days is to make sure that New York City, which has a history of being a very accessible and wonderful place for people who are blind to travel, we want to keep it accessible. These days there's been so many rapid changes in our streetscape, the bicycle lanes, the new turning lanes that the DOT is putting in, uh, different signaling systems that are putting in and moving traffic more quickly. A lot of those changes have an impact on people with visual impairments and blind people. And we want to make sure that whatever the city does and whatever the state does, they keep it as accessible for us as it is for everybody else. And not to put you on the spot, but if you on a scale from one, one to 10, what rating would you give New York City in terms of access for the community, the, in terms of the infrastructure and digitally? Well, that is a tough question. <laughs> New York City is usually a nine or a 10. These days, maybe a little less so, but I would give kudos to a lot of the agencies that have been very cooperative with the past coalition. Uh, the Department of Transportation has worked with us. We meet with them regularly. They've had open minds and they've listened to our concerns. And they have done their best to implement programs that are keeping the city accessible. And the MTA has done a pretty good job too. Uh, we have some issues, ongoing issues in keeping the cities accessible, keeping the accessible pedestrian signals uh, working. Uh, and so there are issues there, are inter intergovernmental agency issues that we're dealing with connecting the DOT, the police department, the anti-terrorist folks, and all these people aware of the needs of blind people as they build new systems to keep New Yorkers safe. Thank you so much, Gene. So Wally, he's a digital accessibility coordinator, and given his own tie to New York City, he's also a Baruch alum, so he holds New York City agencies accountable and making sure that their content, their digital content, is accessible, but besides Wally holding the New York City government agencies accountable, what can the community do to get involved? Well, first I would say I'm also a proud Baruch graduate. I uh, graduated with my BS, uh, my home college was Baruch, I graduated through the CUNY uh, BA program. So I spent some time here at Baruch myself and very happy for that. Uh, you know, speaking about what Wally was talking about, the most interesting thing to me is what they're developing with the uh, street crossing apps and keeping those things as accessible to New Yorkers. You know, a lot of us in the blind and visually impaired communities, we're not all facile with smartphones. You know, we can't all buy, buy a thousand dollar iPhone X. So we want to make sure that the technology is as accessible and easy to access for everybody in the community. And of course, accessible pedestrian signals installed at corners, the devices that make sounds, are the best option. That said, the community can be involved by contact contacting us at the PASS Coalition and getting involved with us, because we are a coalition of blindness professionals, O&M instructors, and members of the blindness and visually impaired communities, and other people with disabilities. So contacting us is one way to keep the community involved. And the other thing is to show up when the city has hearings. Show up and let the city know what your needs are. Go to the community board meetings in your areas. All those things keep 
the city, enti city entities aware of our needs. Thank you, Gene. So there's a lot of Baruch pride in the room. I also an alumna of Baruch. I have my bachelor's in journalism and my master of public administration from this fine college. So a lot of Baruch pride. Okay. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to ask? Uh, you, you just saw my questions. Were there any other takeaways that you would like to share with those tuning into the live stream? Thank you very much. I'll just end with uh, a mention of our website, PASS Coalition, one word, dot org. And there you'll find how contact information. If you have questions about accessible pedestrian signals or the other things the city is doing, uh, let us know because we'd like to be a voice for the community that connects well with the city, and we think we're doing that. And thank you so much. Thank you for, thank you for time, Gene, and thank you to our live stream audience.
Dreamers, are you ready? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and all other persons, and all four-footed creatures. Can we have your attention, please? Okay, everybody, remember that, as I said this morning, we are streaming. So we are now live to the world. And so what that means is that if you um, talk too much, I don't mean to, but if you do, it's going to interrupt what the people watching from somewhere else hear. So I really ask if we can kind of make an effort. Um, and besides, this is all about awards. This is all about, um, you know, people who have done extraordinary things. And so we don't want to miss anything. Now, before we start our regular program, we have a guest up here at this table to my left who has a really busy day and wasn't able to join us in the morning, but wanted to come and be a part of our event today. So I would ask to ask you please to give it up for the commissioner of the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, Mr. Victor Khaleesi. Hello everyone, thank you for having me here today. How's everyone's day going? Don't we love the, what is it, the Karen L. Gorgi Conference of Visual Impairment and Employment Policy and Practice. Take action, right? If there's anyone that I've known um, in, in the community that has taken action is Karen Gorgi. If I think about all the times that Karen Gorgi has called me and called me out on things, it's because she always takes action. Victor, there's something wrong here. Victor, there's something wrong there. Victor, you need to make a change here. And you know what? She's always right. Thank and the you. great thing about her, she comes to us in a way that's constructive. It's not about pointing the finger. Uh, well, it is a little bit because there's <laughs> often times that we are wrong, but it's about uh, pointing the finger and making sure that she's there to, for the support, that she's there to make the effective change for our community to ensure that New York City is the most accessible city in the world. And Karen, I just want to thank you for everything that you do for all of us. Thank you. Thank all right, you. let's give her a hand, everyone. And, and as we work to make New York City the most accessible city in the world, you, will, you heard earlier today, for those who, of you who were in the room, of the wonderful work that we're doing to increase accessibility for people with visual disabilities. And while I and Jonathan presented on lots of different topics from our disability service facilitators and how we're making documents and social media accessible, and most of all, how we're holding our government accountable for the things that we do. And that's my job, to ensure that that happens. And I'm happy to be able to serve you for the past six years. And I continue to do that for the next three. And we'll see who comes after that. So we need to make New York City the most accessible city in the world. And the only way we can do that is hearing back from you and you telling us what we can do in a constructive way. So Karen, thank you uh, for having me here today. And I look forward to the awards. Thank you, Victor. So now we will move along as the program suggests, which is a cue to Dawn if she's here. Is Dawn here? Yay. So um, now it's very appropriate, if you ask me, that we had the commissioner up here. And now we are going to present the Matthew P. Sapolin Visionary Award. That's the commissioner Matthew P. Sapolin Visionary Award. And here coming to us to introduce the awardee for this year is Dawn Suvino, who many of you know for many years, been in our field, and claims that she even had something to do with getting our winner into the field. So let's hear it for Dawn. Beautiful. Thank you very much, folks. It's great to be here today. Um, 
So some of you know me, and um, certainly I'm thrilled to be here today to present this award to a dear, dear friend of mine and someone who is well-deserving of the Visionary Award. Uh, her name will be familiar to everyone, and I'm going to reveal it right now, and that's uh, Janice O'Connor. Let's get a big hand right away. Yes. Thank you. I've known Janice since 1995, when she first came to work at Lighthouse, what was then called Westchester Lighthouse. We both worked there. I had been there a few years as the assistive technology specialist, and uh, Janice came on as the supported employment specialist. Some of you may know that supported employment is a particularly difficult or challenging, let's say, field to the extent that you're working with individuals with multiple disabilities. Prior to coming on board at Lighthouse, Janice had worked at YAI, which primarily serves individuals who have uh, developmental disabilities or intellectual disabilities. Uh, when coming on board at Lighthouse, she would now be working with folks with not only mental illness, developmental delays, uh, orthopedic impairments, but everyone had to be legally blind. So the big challenge for Janice was that she hadn't really worked with folks with blindness prior to that. So I was tasked with sort of giving Janice her baptism by fire, introduction to blindness. And as some of you may know, back then, 1995, I was an evil child. And I uh, told Janice some untruths about blindness. I, for one, I remember I told her that blind people could feel colors, that we could touch things, and we would know what color they were. And she was so open and, and wonderful that she actually believed me. And um, it wasn't until years later that I told her that I was lying. And she said, well, but I've been telling people that you said this. And I said, well, it's not true. But of course, those of you who know Janice also know that she has her own mischievous side, and she got me back plenty of times over the past 23 years. And um, that's how I became well acquainted with what I call her witchy poo cackle, where she'll just take you out and laugh uh, hysterically. So anyway, um, so over those years, Janice and I worked really closely together um, on employment issues and assistive technology issues. Um, I'm very proud to say, and looking through my notes over the years, we presented at a conference in 1999, the Vision 99 conference, we presented a, a paper called Career Highways, and it explained the way that blind folks should and in fact must use the internet for job seeking activities. And just to be uh, give you a sense of where we were at that point, I looked at my notes, and in system specifications, it indicated that you must have a computer with 32 MB of RAM, four, <laughs> four gig of hard drive, and a high speed 56K modem. So um, this is going back 20 years, folks. But you know, indeed, it, it shows we were very much in the vanguard. And Janice remained in that vanguard over the years. I remember at one point I was working for another agency. Uh, by the time she had moved on to no longer working in uh, the lighthouse, but she was district office manager at Hempstead. And she gave me a call and said, you know, we have a client who's transitioning female to male, and we need somebody who can be, you know, open and, and, and uh, you know, willing to work with this client with no judgments. And I said, absolutely, please have him come on over and we'll work with him. Again, 10 years before the general public or even the federal government recognized uh, transgender people as a protected class. So once again, um, I guess the thing I want to say most about Janice is that she's always been as open and willing to listen and learn and be creative as anyone I've known in this field, which is certainly why she rose to the ranks that she did in the a state vocational rehab system, and uh, without further delay, I'm proud to present my good friend, the Visionary Award for 2018. Janice, welcome and thank you. Craig, come and read the plaque. Craig. Thank you. 
Janice, I just want to read what's on the, the plaque that we've given you. Um, the Baruch College Computer Center for Visually Impaired People um, presents the Commissioner Matt P. Sapplin Visionary Award to Janice O'Connor in recognition of her comprehensive services and commitment to full access for the blind and low vision community. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you, Don, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Karen and Bill and the conference committee and, and to whoever put my name forward. I was so surprised when Karen called me and said that I was getting this award. Um, I'm especially honored that this is the Matthew Sapplin Award. I didn't know Matt well, but through Matt, when I was working at the Lighthouse, I actually found myself for the first time in my life at Yankee Stadium. And we were there to talk to them about access for people um, who had vision loss. And that rolled into a job save for one of their customer service specialists who was legally blind. And that rolled into internships for young people at Yankee Stadium who were just fabulous fans. CCVIP and this conference have always been very special because it's the only place I know where each year people from every corner of the New York metro area's blind and deafblind community come together to learn, to discuss, to question each other, and to leave with new ideas about emerging technology and strategies for employment. I came to this work during a midpoint in my working life through the employment door, as John mentioned. And I was going to talk about that color thing myself. <laughs> But then I, I talked to a friend who called me, and she said, what are you going to say? And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about these kind of humorous things. And she said, you can't say that, and you can't say that, and you can't say that. So Dawn, thank you for saying it. <laughs> it's true. I still question it to this day is, could she really tell? And I don't know what secret you used that first time we went shopping at Saks and White Plains. <laughs> But she was telling me what colors the clothes were by putting her tongue on them. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Oh, disgusting. So, so bit by bit, over more than 20 years now, with, by training and building experience with the support, the mentoring and the encouragement of the many people with whom I made connections, and through exploring, observing, and above all, from listening, I learn a few things, maybe a lot of things. What I know is that this work that each of us does isn't easy, that it can be complicated, it can be frustrating, it can be messy, and it can be, in nonprofit language, challenging because we don't use words like hard and messy and so forth. By working together, we overcome a few barriers pretty readily. Some continue <laughs> to seem insurmountable, and new ones always present themselves. But with time and persistence and working together, the barriers topple one by one. We've seen a lot of huge changes, particularly in the area of technology, where downsizing, or downsizing is actually a good thing, where there is now built-in accessibility on many electronic devices. We've seen new approaches to employment with the adoption of programs that embed job seekers with a potential employer and provide training in both soft and hard skills at the employer's site. From my new perch, perch at Reader's Digest Partners for Sight, I've got to become aware of research and programs that are breaking down barriers in website design, in teaching technology in schools, and including low vision services at community health centers, to name just a few. Every day, we have opportunities to listen to one another and to identify and get past the barriers. We have the opportunity to do the work. And when we set ourselves to finding those solutions, a child who's the only blind child in their school goes to camp, meets another child for the first time, 
makes a friend for life and learns about hospitality and food service jobs at a hotel lunch. A teen gets their first after school job and learns to give gallery talks at the Met. <laughs> a young woman who stayed home for 10 years after becoming blind following surgery sets a new path for herself. She begins to volunteer, works that into a full-time paid job, and is able to buy her own apartment. A valuable employee with years of experience on the job begins to lose vision, learns how to feel comfortable discussing the problem with their employer, and gets technology training to keep working. Being visionary to me isn't about being the first or the most inventive. It's looking at what is right in front of us, envisioning what should be, figuring out how to make a change for the better, and having the will to make that change reality. Then there's only one le thing left to do, and that's take action. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Oh, let's give her another hand because she's back with us. Now, I just, if I may, I want to ask, because um, I know we're expecting to be visited by um, Borough President Gail Brewer. Is she in the room yet? No, not yet. She's not. Okay, then I think we should begin to proceed, Dr. Craig Wolfson. <coughs> to begin to um, hand out our uh, vision, our, I didn't say that right, our Breaking Barriers Awards. And then if everybody can be a little flexible, I know she's planning to be here. Um, and when she comes, we will certainly um, give her the opportunity to speak. Okay. Oh, look at that. She's coming in. Well, maybe she'd like five minutes to. Uh, okay. So. So shall we, um, do, shall we do the first two awards? Yes. Okay, so we'll do the first two awards. So let me present um, our colleague and great friend um, from the CCVIP Advisory Board and a longtime sponsor of this event. From Riziki, Riziki and Associates, please welcome Craig Wolfson. Thank you, everybody. It's an honor to be here once again. What a great event. And a special shout out to Janice. It's great to see you. And you really have been an inspiration over the years. So thank you for it was so great that we could honor you. For the first award, I want to, I always read the comments afterwards. And it says the Breaking Barrier Awards take too long. So I'm going to try to be fast this year. Um, the first award is going to be presented by Yolanda Rillman for the Associated for the Visually Impaired. And the award is going to be received by Julie Kelly from the Aerial Design and Build Services. So Yolanda, you want to come up here? Come on, Yolanda. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <laughs> let me write this here. Um, I, nominated, I nominated Ariel Design and Build for providing an opportunity to a visually impaired client. Ariel Design and Build is a boutique firm proudly operating on a referral basis. Provides their customers with an excellence of quality construction service, project management, and workmanship. They are very selective when hiring, and this is, quote, from their website, our team of professionals in-house and outsource are carefully chosen in order to assure a high standard of service. Marco, an AVI client, interview with Ariel Design and Build for the construction project manager. The employer stated that they were interviewing several other candidates but were considering him. Over time, I reached out to them and kept in touch. Every time I received positive responses from the employer, but was told that they were waiting for a few projects to begin. After several months passed with no decision, I reached out again to touch base and offer the employer the work tryout, Employer Incentive Program, through the New York State Commission for the Blind. The employer's response, very positive again, and they agreed on hiring the client using the WTO program. The employer stated that Marco was a very good hire. He fit into the co company culture, and he was a hard worker. 
By utilizing the WT program, the employer was able to give Marco an opportunity in their company without fear of hiring somebody of uh, the wrong person. She found out that Marco is an excellent fit for the company. Marco has been embraced as one of the team members in the company. He received his 90-day review from the employer. He was given an increase in pay and a bonus for doing such a great job. If it were not for the employer working with the WTO program, Marco would probably not have the opportunity to work in a field that he loves. Construction project manager is a job for which employers find it difficult sometimes to hire somebody legally blind. AVI values this forum to acknowledge employees that utilize our incentive programs and give our clients an opportunity. It is an honor to introduce Julie Kelly and Rupilia Seti, and I hope I didn't mispronounce, <laughs> uh, both principal of Ariel Design and Bill. And Julie came from Greece, and I know she's here on business, but I'm going to think she came here just for this luncheon. <laughs> Thank you. And I also, I also want to introduce Marco Valente. I'd like all three to come up, who I'm also very pleased that was here and made time from his busy schedule to be here, because they keep him very busy, which is a good thing. I just wanted to say that <clears throat> for me, life is about opportunity, and I think giving everyone an opportunity is very, very important. And even my own personal, uh, you know, life depends. I, I just believe in you know opportunity. So I think Rupil and I, <clears throat> when we interviewed Marco and we saw what a great guy and his resume was excellent, and we never, never did not consider it for any other reason, you know, we just, like she said, we were waiting on business, and then, we, you know, we just felt that he was totally the right fit, and like I say, we, we, we feel special that we can give somebody an opportunity that may not <clears throat> have it as easy somewhere else, and <clears throat> I think everyone in, in life deserves at least one opportunity, so that's, we're happy. <laughs> Our next award will be presented by Anthony Severo from the Catholic Guild for the Blind, and we are honoring the Energy Economic Development Corporation, specifically James Hendon. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. I uh, had the good fortune to meet the recipient of today's Breaking Barriers Award, James Hendon, who is the founder and CEO of Energy Economic Development approximately four years ago. Uh, and he was affiliated then with another organization that had performed a similar type of service that he'll talk to you about later on. The meeting occurred when both of us became members of a newly created committee launched by the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce called the Veterans Business Affairs Council, because James is a veteran. I'm not, but they invited me on it anyhow, which shows you the, the awards of being able to network. <clears throat> At the conclusion of the first meeting, after we introduced ourselves, and I told James what I do, and I had spoken about the work experience training program and the need for clients who are visually impaired to have opportunities to prove their skills, restore their confidence, and hopefully on occasion, segue directly to employment. And James replied he was quite interested in serving as such a conduit, but he wasn't ready. And the organization he was a critical part of then also wasn't ready, but he would get back to me when the time was right. Now, as all of you who do placement and set up internships know, the first inclination on hearing that would be, sure you will when pigs can fly. <laughs> 
But to my positive chagrin, James did get back to me after six months, and we set up a WET for one of my clients, which resulted in performing so well that he became gainfully employed in 2016. That was a client of Brenda Garbus, David Valerio. So when James branched out on his own and launched Energy Economic Development, it was mutually agreed to continue the success that originally began three years ago. So during this period, James has taken on multiple clients as wet interns to assist him in building his energy analysis and retrofitting business in the hope of providing a launching pad for them to gain valuable experience and assist them with connections he has to guide them to career opportunities that they might deem more suitable to their skills and interests. But there was always a hope that one of the wet interns would do so well and would enjoy promoting the business that Energy DC would have sufficient cash flow that a wet intern would become a permanent part-time employee. So I'm pleased to announce that time is now. My client, Casey Greer, who was referred to me by Cheryl Hunter, is an aspiring musical theater actress and who came to New York from Memphis, Tennessee. Makes sense. And uh, she attended work readiness training and has been a wet intern for NHEDC and has done such excellent work that soon she will become a permanent part-time employee in the near future. And Casey wanted to work part-time because it affords her the opportunity to go on auditions for musical theater roles and it meets the needs and fiscal capabilities of NHEDC at the present time. So I figure only Yenta the matchmaker could have done better. <laughs> Unfortunately, Casey's out of town, but it's my privilege to introduce James Hendon, the founder and CEO of Energy EDC, to say a few words. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. Before I you know, uh, begin, I just wanted to give a few thank yous. First, to, to the host of this event, to CZVIP, uh, then to the New York Commission for the Blind, the reason all of us are here, and then uh, last but not least, to the Catholic Guild for the Blind to call people by name, you know, to Karen uh, Gorgie from CCVIP, to Cheryl Hunt, to the, co the counselor we worked with for the Commission for the Blind, and to Judith Katzen, and of course, my brother from another mother here, Tony Severo <laughs> from, uh, from Catholic Charities. Yeah. And uh, I also want to give you greetings on behalf of Casey Greer, who couldn't make it. She is the uh, person who's working for me now. Casey is at a wedding in Tennessee, literally right now, because it was an early wedding, she's getting ready to elbow some other bridesmaids to go catch a bouquet. <laughs> so she sends her regards. I'm really not kidding. That's what's going down right now. Um, so, you know, three quick, three quick things. I just want to point out that I recognize this stuff is bigger than just us, as far as Energy EDC or the Guild or CCVIP or even the Commission for the Blind. You know, everyone in this room cares about making a dynamic where a man or woman can rise by merit and not by anything else. There's a quote from Irma Bombeck, it's, you know, at the end of my life, when my maker asks me, what did you do? I want to say, I used everything you gave me. All of us here trying to make a dynamic where every person is able to use everything they've been given and just put any other issues aside. So I just want to point that out. Um, another thing I wanted to say, second one was, you know, all this stuff comes down to relationships. You know, I mean, I got a good relationship with this guy. I met him at a meeting. He's a smooth talker. We just, we hit it off. It was love at first sight, good bromance. And I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be here but for it. And I just wanted to point out just the value of um, being able to take advantage of this connection that we all have. So, you know, please feel free to approach me afterwards. I'm happy to talk with anyone about what I do, et cetera. But I just wanted to call that out. And then kind of piggybacking on relationships, you know, the fact that we need to help each other. I met Tony and I needed help in my business where I was at the time. I desperately needed help, but I thought I could do it all on my own. And it took me a, a bit of a reckoning to get to a place where I said, you know what, I need help. Let me reach out to these folks. That business wouldn't be alive, but for Tony getting us in touch with David Valerio and other wets who worked to help keep them afloat. And then same thing when I set up my own shop to go to him and say, you know what, I don't wanna make that same mistake and wait, let me just go and get this help now. So just, we're here as far as the employers benefiting just as much as you all in benefit for those who get the work experience. I just want to point that out too. Um, yeah. And then I, I know time is short, but speaking of help, one way that, 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 and I don't, I'll be shameless with this, a way you can help not just me, but Casey is, you know, any referrals you guys have for us for folks who can use uh, an energy efficiency assessment. You know, right now, Casey started out making cold calls for me. She was calling small businesses, nonprofits. She did so well at that job as we elevated her. She now manages our commercial tenant program. What that means is the state of New York will pay our firm 
to perform an energy assessment of an office space as long as it's not in a government building. So if you, anybody is working in a space where it's office and it's not a government building, or you know someone who is, feel free to email Casey. Her address is Casey at energyedc.com. She's doing the work. I'm telling you right now, but she's doing the work. Email Casey at energyedc.com so we can connect these dots because I'm telling you, the money that comes from that, that's what she's eating through right now. So this is real. So this isn't no, I'm just, you know, being clean. We all helping each other, transparent. So once again, her number is 646. Six, this is her work number. This is her work number. It's, I mean, hey, 646. 646-664-1198. Her email address is Casey at energyedc.com. And any office space that's not in a government building, you know, we're happy to do it and keep advancing this. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, James. Well, it's fabulous. Fabulous. So, friends, we're going to take a little moment, a little breather, because, you know, this morning, um, because this morning, um, if you remember, David Burtzel was mentioning about the importance of knowing people who are elected and who, with whom you can speak about your needs and uh, in front of whom you can put the issues that are so important to you. And we've been very lucky to be visited again this year by somebody who really, really embodies that. She was actually the first keynoter that we had in our conference all the way back in 2008. And friends, I really would like you to help me give the most humongous shout out for Borough President Gail Brewer. Gail, thank you so much. For Thank you very much. It is, it is a real honor to be here, and every year this conference gets bigger and bigger. And I have to say, so far, Karen, the honorees are phenomenal, and that's a real credit to you and to the center. And in talking to this wonderful commissioner, we know that in New York City, as big as we are, this center is incredibly important, as is this conference, because you're unique. You are uh, the backbone of so many uh, innovative ideas that come out of technology. And as I always say, whenever you're helping one group of people, you often help another. Commissioner and Karen know that I'm a huge techie, so anything that has a technology front, I'm all for because it is changing all the time and helping people. Technology is to help people. It's not for technology's sake. And this center has been the embodiment of that kind of effort. So I just want to thank everybody. It's not just Karen. She'll be the first to tell you. There's a lot of people who've been involved, and congratulations to everybody and to the students who are here today because they get something out of it, even though they help. So, you know, I have a, a, a very minor record in terms of the work that we've done, but certainly working with Karen and others, we worked on the uh, signals that are hopefully the Accessible Pedestrian Signal Program. It has been a slow, slow road in the sense that uh, trying to get the Department of Transportation, with all due respect, to make sure that we can cross all roads safely is a challenge, but we're working on it. Um, we, passed, we passed legislation, as they say, as Karen used the word, way back, way back in 2012. I've been around so long, that sounds fairly recently. Um, <laughs> and then, and that was only 25 accessible signals, and now with Council Member Mark Levine in 2014, we added another 75. It's a slow pace, but at least it's going in the right direction, and I expect everybody to push your elected officials and the council to advocate for more, because obviously there are more than a few signals that need it, are needed in the city of New York. So I just want you to, uh, indicate, as uh, Dr. Bursell stated, Dean Bursell, advocate and fuss is a good thing to do. And certainly signals are one thing to fuss about. Um, this, uh, I'm going to give Karen a proclamation in a minute. But, you know, in 20, 2005, when I was in the city council, I was there for 12 years, we did do a braille in braille, and I'm afraid this one isn't. But that would be another thing to fuss about. When people give out proclamations, they should be in languages that people use, and I just want to throw that out. Something very special. When I was in the council and now as borough president, I'm a big believer in fresh fruits and vegetables. Not that I eat them all the time, but I know I'm supposed to. 
I know I'm supposed to. And I'm also a believer in helping the farmers, both at the green market and, of course, those that are around the metropolitan area. They have a hard time. And every time we have fresh fruits and vegetables through the green market or Grow NYC, we help the farmers. And so we actually have been, from the tip of Manhattan to the bottom, working in the senior centers to make sure that for $8, they have fresh fruits and vegetables every week during the growing season. And I want to say Visions has been one of our very best customers. And I want to thank you. And, and the weekly produce guide is in large print and braille, and those individuals, just like I, I do it every single week also, because I can pay $8, so I do it. Um, in our office, in the borough president, you know, what in the world does a borough president do? We work mostly on zoning and land use, which has to be the hardest topic. The commissioner knows as hard as it is to deal with human services and issues regarding technology, uh, fighting for affordable housing is perhaps the hardest thing in our entire city. So we do a lot of that, and I wish I could say I was more successful, but we're working on it. We appoint community board members, and we try to take disability into account. If somebody wants to be on a community board, please let us know, because we work really, really hard to make sure that those issues are addressed in every community. We have 12 in Manhattan, 59 in the whole entire city. We also allocate funding, and of course, we pass legislation. But nothing is a, everything, I'm a really bad elected official, because everything is a priority. You know how some people <laughs> prioritize, but certainly the concerns that Karen and you are advocating for today. Um, we don't put them as disability or senior or commuter. To me, if you have a barrier, let's try to figure out how we can overcome it. And that's always been uh, the way in which I try to operate as an elected official. We can resolve issues when we work together. This conference today is an example. Unfortunately, you can't ever stop having conferences because it's a big city. You know, we're the fourth largest in the United States. We're bigger than, well, the United States is bigger, okay. California <laughs> is bigger, okay. The state of New York is bigger, okay. Guess who's next? City of New York. Forget Pennsylvania, forget New Jersey, forget <laughs> Illinois. They're all smaller. So your being here today is an example of how you need to solve problems because we're so big that we need to have these discussions. So I'm really, I'm honored to be here. Just like, I mean, poor Dr. Gorgi probably has so many accolades which she deserves and proclamations, but I, I want to just give her this proclamation which says in part, all the things she accomplishes all the time. The MTA has talking kiosks because of her advocacy. As you know, she's a worldwide expert on this issue and she's worked really hard with us on this pedestrian accessible uh, signals, both with the city and with the governor. Um, she is a, an honoree uh, in many different locations, but to me, more importantly, with the lab, with CCVIP, she has become, a, it has, she has made it a Microsoft Education Award. She got that award. This issue of figuring out how technology can really help individuals is a challenge. And it only happens when you have a lab, when you have people who are trained to work in it to assist others. And I can't tell you how difficult that is. I do have a sense of how difficult it is. So I, Gail Brewer, as your borough president, hereby commend Dr. Karen Gorty for her contributions that are ongoing to our city and proclaim Friday, April 13, 2018, Karen Gorty Appreciation Day in the borough of Manhattan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't even know what to say. I, I really don't. I just, I just hope we all become 
one big advocacy engine together and not let nobody get away with nothing. Let's go for the next award. Our next award will be presented by Debbie Fitterer and Nancy Carrazzo from Helen Keller National Center. They'll be honoring Lisa Jackson from the Staybridge Suites Hotel. Thank you. Um, Helen Keller National Center is honored to present this year's Breaking Barriers Award to Staybridge Suites Hotel. When we approached Dr. Rajiv Mehta, whose family owns the hotel, about employing a deafblind individual, his goals were right in line with our agency's mission. We discussed the needs of the hotel and the ways in which our deafblind job seekers could meet those needs and contribute to the operations of the hotel in a positive way. Staybridge now has two deafblind employees, one in the kitchen and one in laundry services, as well as a deafblind clerical intern in the reservations office. Ms. Lisa Jackson, Director of Housekeeping, manages a team of staff who embody the definition of hospitality. All of the staff at Staybridge could not have been more willing to welcome the new hires. They are eager to learn how to communicate with and support our consumers, as well as how to use and maintain the adaptive devices and equipment that our consumers use to work effectively as part of the team. So from all of us at Helen Keller National Center, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Staybridge Suites Hotel. And we're very honored to present you with this award. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Sorry, just have a few notes. I know I'm here to be honored on the part of Rajiv and the State Bridge staff, but I'm honored to be here, period. Seeing everyone in this room right here just coming together for a common goal is amazing, especially in the times that we live in right now. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much to the organizers, to the staff in the blue. You guys have done an amazing job. I felt welcome as soon as I came through the elevator door, so thank you. Like these two ladies just said, we work, I work in hospitality is what we do. We provide guests with the best possible service that we can provide, pretty much. Um, I work with Bela White. She is in our laundry service, and she does an amazing job. She is deaf and she is blind, but you wouldn't be able to know it if it wasn't on her button on her side. <laughs> the way she operates that laundry room, it's like that's her home, that's where she belongs. Nancy actually um, trained her. She was there with her for months, if I'm not mistaken. She's done a great job. She has really done a great job. Thank you, Nancy. Bela gets in at 10 every day. We know when she comes in, she rings her bell, and she gets straight to work. She knows what she needs to do, how she needs to do it. She, needs, she knows how to get around. We also have guests who come into the laundry room, and when they see Bela, they're first taken aback, but as they watch her, they see that she has everything under control. I love that she's with us. It's not a burden to us that she's with us. Just like she's learning from us, we have learned from her, and it's an honor to see what she can do. You know, she's in a world where it might seem like she's at a disadvantage, but she's really not. She's blessed. We are blessed to have her. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for this award, for the acknowledgement. I'm just so happy that we're able to make a change, though we might seem, it might seem that it's something small, but just standing here and seeing all of you, it makes a big difference. And I'm happy that we can do that because change is something that is great. And the better you can adapt to change, the more intelligent you are. I truly believe that. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for this award.
Our next award will be presented by Walter Dickinson from Helen Keller Services for the Blind. We'll be honoring Dr. Raymond Franzum from AHRC. Uh, before I begin with Helen Keller Services recipient for 2018 Breaking Barriers Award, I'd like to take a minute to thank some key people who continually help me provide services for the consumers that I assist in youth services. First, I'd like to broadly thank the New York State Commission for the Blind for the continued support of our youth and adult programs. Then more specifically, I'd like to single out a few people who are important to my work on a daily basis and making sure that students that I work with have the services they need and the support they deserve. I'd like to thank Ms. Iris Popkin and Richard Brown, Youth Transition Counselors from the Harlem office for their tireless efforts on behalf of their young consumers. I'd like to thank Ms. Barbara Campbell, Harlem Senior Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor for always being available to capably assist with any situation that arises. I'd like to thank Mr. Sean Chinchance, Harlem DM, and Mr. Jason uh, Eckert, Downstate Coordinator for the support they have given programs that I've worked on. And I should also throw in a thank you for Mr. Paul Jurassi, uh, uh, counselor and children's consultant at the 80 Maiden Lane office for doing such a great job with his kids so that by the time I get them they already have some amazing skills. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you and I thank you for your support. If there was a award that I could give you today I definitely would. If I left anybody out please forgive me. The general consensus at last year's uh, conference was that I really do go on too long. <laughs> and now for the reason I'm here today uh, to recognize an exemplary community partner who has been pivotal in the placement of several of my summer youth interns, Dr. Raymond Franzum. Dr. Franzum, who has received his doctorate from Fordham University in Social Work, is the Director of Internships for HRC New York City. HRC is a family-governed organization committed to finding ways for people with intellectual and other developmental disabilities to build full lives as defined by each person and supported by dedicated families, staff, and community partners. HRC employees embrace values of passion, respect, integrity, diversity, and excellence. In his role as Director of Internships, Dr. Raymond Franzum is a personification of these core ideals. I had the good fortune to attend his intern or orientation last year, and I was amazed at the level of instruction he was delivering and the high level of accountability he was fostering in young attendees. Dr. Franzum brings old school values to the new generation and demands a high level of professionalism. Is exactly the type of inspirational role model that I would like to be for my own consumers. This past summer, Dr. Franzum developed key student placements at the HRC Fisher Day Center, the Melissa Riggio Higher Education Program, and at the College of Staten Island and the Francis of Paola Early Learning Center. Dr. Franzum is receiving a Breaking Barriers Award today for the thoughtful efforts in positioning our young consumers in demanding and rewarding internships throughout the HRC family service locations. Dr. Fransom, wherever you may be. Oh, there he is. All right. AHRC NYC uh, firmly believes that what's important is what a person can do, not what they cannot do. And throughout my life, I've had the opportunity to work with people who are visually hearing impaired, have physical disability. When I had the opportunity to start the internship program at AHRC, it was natural that we form alliances with all people. Vision and hearing and physical ability are attributes. It's only an attribute among the many attributes that people have. When people have the opportunity to use their skill and pursue their interest, they amaze us. And I have been amazed when a person with, who is using a wheelchair ended up organizing and leading exercise groups. When someone who was blind 
ended up facilitating a drama group. Give people an opportunity to do what they can do, and they amaze you. Why, we never ask, <coughs> what can we do for you? That's a terrible question. The same thing that we ask for any employee or any intern, <coughs> what can you bring to us? And what they bring is truly amazing. Thank you. Our final award will be presented by Jaden Mitchell from the Lighthouse Guild. We'll be honoring New York University School of Professional Studies Division of Programs in Business. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll go ahead and start by saying that I share Walter's affliction and going on way too long. So I know that the clock is on us, so uh, as the last presenters of today, but I do want to give due deference to our honorees this afternoon. My name is Jaden Mitchell. I'm standing here with my colleague, Ed Plumacher, and we are here representing quite a number of people from our organization, Lighthouse Guild, to thank an exceptional group of professionals from New York University. A large institution to be sure, but we are honoring three people from the Human Resources Division as well as the Division of Programs and Business. Those people here today are Nagar Farakish, who is the Academic Director of that division, uh, Kelly Collier-Brown, who is the Equal Opportunity Manager, and Darian Huntley, who is the Human Resources Manager. We are thanking them today not for hiring an individual with vision impairment, as is typically the expectation of the Breaking Barriers Award but rather for making it possible for their employee to come back to full duty after experiencing vision loss. That employee, our client, is here today and we have permission to share her name and I'd like to because in many ways, as much as we're honoring her employer, we're also honoring her. She is one of our heroes, as all of our clients are. Athena Wilson had been an employee of this uh, division for a number of years <coughs> until sudden and profound vision loss occurred. And it's no mystery to anybody in this room that that is a life-changing experience and one that comes with a number of concerns and anxieties. And if you're midway through your career, the concern and anxiety that leaps to your mind most likely is, what is my employer going to think? Am I going to be able to keep this job? How on earth am I going to be able to do that? In the case of Athena, she had to take some time away to begin the process of rehabilitation and adjusting. During that time, she took advantage of all the services that were available to her from the Commission for the Blind and through Lighthouse Guild. And if I may say, by took advantage of, I mean dove headfirst into, immersed herself in, worked her proverbial you-know-what off, <laughs> to the point that in basically, relatively speaking, record time, she was able to get back to her life and back to work. Athena's grit, determination, and perseverance are remarkable. But the other remarkable part of the story is the extent to which her employer stood ready to welcome her back. They reached out to us, not the other way around. NYU reached out to Lighthouse Guild to seek our guidance, our recommendations. They welcomed us into their fray, allowed us to come in and do a complete job analysis, test out the software, get into their personal systems, meet their coworkers. Basically, they made it easy. And once we got in there, we realized that this was not just a matter of bringing in an employee back. They wanted their employee back. They saw way beyond the vision impairment and recognized that this is somebody that had proven long ago her skills, talents, and value, and vision impairment didn't matter. And that represents the spirit of breaking barriers. If I, if I don't know if that's that, nothing does. So this has been very much a team effort. I have my colleague Ed here next to me who has been very much a lifeline to Athena throughout all this. He is our assistive technology specialist, and he would like to share a couple of words as well. I'm going to pass the mic over to him. It's right there. It's in front of you. Okay. Right. In front of you. Okay. And it's just right. Yep. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to uh, just recognize Athena for a few moments. I mean, I worked very closely with her throughout this process, and um, working with Athena, I just have two things that come to mind, and that is commitment and courage. Athena worked very hard. She was always there. She was always diligent about showing up on time. She was always diligent about putting the work and getting things done. 
If you know Athena, she is determined, she does take action, and she's not afraid to conf confront issues that are within and even those that are beyond her control. She had a good working relationship with the Lighthouse, worked with many of my colleagues, developed a skill set in assistive technology to, to be able to go back to work, and, and uh, as of the end of today, I believe she has completed 11 months back on the job. <laughs> Athena maintained a good working relationship with the New York State Commission for the Blind. Her counselor, Daniel Diaz, was always there for meetings, always there for advice, and had a, an unwavering commitment to making sure that she had the resources to succeed. I've been happy to work with Athena. Athena, I just want to let you know you inspire me. And um, <laughs> I'm just honored to have had the privilege to work with you. Thank you. Hopefully, hopefully it is clear now that this is an extraordinary team of people to work with. So if our guests from NYU could please come up and be recognized. Everybody, please join me in recognizing and thanking Kelly, Nagar, Darian, and the team from NYU. Athena, please come up. us. Um, we'd like to specifically thank uh, the New York State Commission for the Blind, CCVIP, and the Lighthouse Guild for this honor. Um, as many of you know, it does take the support of an entire community to make sure we are creating inclusive spaces, that we're maintaining a dedication and a commitment to uh, keeping talented individuals within our organization, no matter what challenges they may face throughout their lives. Um, it takes excellent administrators, HR professionals, and accommodations professionals to all work in partnership with um, subject matter experts, such as the fantastic team at the Lighthouse Guild. Um, Athena, you have truly broken barriers for NYU. Um, your success is a result of your skills, your talent, your dedication, um, your willingness, and your hard work um, really is an inspiration to us all every day. We continue to learn from you. Um, we are so proud uh, to have you as a val valued member of our NYU community. Um, we make a commitment to you, um, to all of our employees, to all of our prospective employees, <laughs> um, to continue learning from you, uh, to continue learning from the Lighthouse Guild and other valued agencies in this room, um, to expand our services and our inclusion efforts until we reach our goal of true universal access. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> What fabulous, fabulous awards and I failed to mention all day long that the other people who were critical, wait, 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 the other people who were critical in planning this event, represented by Debbie Fitterer, please let's give a shout out to the placement professionals in New York City, the placement consortium, everybody. Now, we have two more things to do. The last thing we'll do will be to have Sergeant Judith Gerber start the vendors on their procession of announcing who they are and where they are. But this conference would not be the conference that it is without the volunteers who give so 
blank, excuse me, so much time to planning. And their coordinator is here to present the volunteer awards for 2018, Lisa Saunders. Thank you, and thank you for that warm round of applause for our wonderful volunteers. I'm presenting the Louise Tropp Volunteer Service Award to a volunteer who has worked at the conference for three years. My first certificate is to Aaron Lung. service. My second is to Svetlana Dubova. The next is to Jonathan Liu. My next is to someone who has helped me in the office and at the, as a volunteer, a sighted guide, and basically anything that was asked of these next two volunteers. The first goes to Dr. Lynn Luxton. Yay. My last award, ditto, anything before the conference, during the conference, after the conference. I could not have done it without, without my volunteers. Nancy O'Connell. Yes. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. Thank you. We are going to close our live stream now. Um, we thank you streamers for being with us. We're thrilled to have had you. And now, are, is the vendor brigade ready? I think you each get about 30 seconds. So, should we have them rock?